Good morning, everyone. We will begin our program shortly. A few reminders to ensure the smooth flow of our program. For NSPP students, please do not forget to sign the registration sheets outside the auditorium. Approach Padayon or NSPP staff if you have any concerns. This forum will end at 12 o'clock noon. Avoid loitering around and frequently exiting and entering the auditorium while the program is going on. Minimize noise and listen to the lectures. Eating and littering inside the auditorium is strictly prohibited. We have limited Wi-Fi access inside the auditorium. Should you need to connect to the internet, you may connect to NSC Wi-Fi or switch to your mobile data. That's my bay will be live streamed YouTube by the Information Technology Development Center. We are now live at livestream.up.edu.ph. Hashtag that's my bay will begin in two minutes. Kindly settle. Set kindly settle down on your seats. Occupy the front row seats.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hashtag That's My Bay, a forum on UP initiatives in keeping Manila Bay alive. Everyone, please rise for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem.
You may now take your seats. Good morning, everyone. It is our honor to recognize the presence of the following people in Hashtag That's My Bay, a forum on UP initiatives in keeping Manila Bay alive. Dr. Elena Pernia, Vice President for Public Affairs. <laughs> Representatives from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. <laughs> Our other VIPs will arrive soon. To officially open today's forum, uh, we would like to welcome Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena Pernia. International Coast Up Cleanup Day 2019, some 20,000 people participated in yet another cleanup. The numbers of volunteers have grown since January this year when it started, when the cleanup started, indicating that many of our people do care for the rehabilitation of the bay and are willing to volunteer their resources. One of the 20,000 volunteers was my youngest child, who joined his office mates in cleanup activities in the Las Piñas, Paranaque, Critical Habitat, and Ecotourism area. Back home last Saturday, he told the family that there, there is much more to be done, and he enjoined us to volunteer. Indeed, the Manila Bay is huge. It covers eight provinces and 178 local governments in three regions. It has a total land area, uh, a total area of 1,994 square kilometers and a coastline that stretches 190 kilometers. As the Supreme Court itself noted, the cleanup 
and restoration of Manila Bay is only an aspect and the initial stage of a long-term solution. The preservation of the water quality of the bay after the rehabilitation process is, an Im is as important as the cleanup phase. A whole society approach is necessary to achieve our collective hope for the return of the Manila Bay to its former glory, a remarkable natural endowment that is a source of food, employment, income, transportation, recreation, beauty, culture, and history. Today's forum is a movement towards that objective, and your, our presence this morning is a healthy sign of our collective concern for the Manila Bay and our commitment to its rehabilitation. On behalf of the officials of the University of, Philippi of the Philippines, I bid you all welcome to the UP Diliman I Diliman's Institute of Environmental Science and Meteorology and today's discussion of hashtag that's my bay. To our UP faculty, scientists, and researchers who have done studies and are currently involved in the Manila Bay Rehabilitation Project, thank you for being here and for sharing your expertise. Greetings also to the DENR for your presence here this morning. Congratulations and thanks to the hardworking UP Padayon Public Service Office, its director, Dr. Jet Yasol Naval, and her staff who put this forum together. It is now to time to listen to how we can help Manila Bay, how we can help keep Manila Bay alive. Thank you and good morning. Thank you very much, Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena E. Pernia. We will be briefed on the Manila Bay Sustainable Development Master Plan by a former UPLB Chancellor, who is also a professor at the College of Forestry and Natural Resources, where he also served as Dean. His leaders leadership in academe, in science, and in public service earned him a privileged spot in the roster of academicians at the National Academy of Science and Technology of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Dr. Rex Victor O. Cruz. Morning to everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us to uh, make a brief uh, presentation about uh, Manila Bay and uh, the master plan that we're trying to uh, develop, you know, for uh, Manila Bay. Uh, with me uh, this morning is our team leader for the study team, uh, JJ, <laughs> and uh, our. Uh, uh, expert on coastal disaster risk reduction, uh, Hans. They are both from uh, the Deltares, which is a partner uh, of uh, the local consulting uh, firms in developing the master plan. Again, as I said, you know, thank you very much for inviting us, and uh, we consider this to be part of um, to be part of our continuing effort to uh, reach out to the different stakeholders in order to make the uh, Manila Bay uh, Master Plan truly responsive not only to the, to the issues that we're trying to address, but also to make this relevant to the different stakeholders you know, that, they, that all of you may be able to appreciate the value of the Master Plan as a tool for ensuring the sustainability and resiliency of Manila Bay over the long term. Uh, I'd also like to... Uh, to greet the mga, mga course speakers, current presenters this uh, this morning, uh, a number of you have been uh, involved no, in the past uh, consultation of uh, this project. Dito pa nakita si Dr. Laura. Lapata si Dr. Laura. Then of course si Dr. Ben Palejo and then si Dr. Rene Rollon. And then si Prof. Uh, Melody Ocampo. And then si, hindi uh, ko pa nakita si Doc uh, Mahar. Uh, and then, of course, si uh, Professor Giovanni uh, Tapang. 
I haven't seen anyone from the DNI yet. I haven't seen uh, Jake around. Oh, representing Jake, okay, welcome. And uh, yes, uh, thank you to Chet no, for uh, uh, inviting us to make this presentation. Thank you very much. Um, let me now uh, proceed to the brief uh, presentation of uh, where we are now in terms of developing the master plan for uh, Manila Bay. I guess uh, at the outset, I'd like to um, I'd like to say that uh, this is very much a work in progress, and uh, whatever you you will see here in this presentation are very much uh, uh, under the process of uh, refinement and fine tuning, and uh, that is uh, what exactly we're doing uh, at this very point in time, starting in June until uh, next month. And hopefully after next month, you know, we'll have a version of the um, Manila Bay Master Plan that, you know, that we can already start, you know, uh, uh, planning for the uh, operational plan no, of uh, the Master Plan. So, but for now, you know, what I will present to you is where we are right now. And as I said, you know, this is work in progress. So, um, the uh, the Manila Bay, uh, the, the rationale, you know, the justification and the triggers for the development of this uh, master plan for Manila Bay, you know, I think uh, uh, cannot be overemphasized and uh, is already, you know, a, a well-known uh, fact, you know, among all of you, and that's why you're here, you know, because Manila Bay is important to you, and that we all know that Manila Bay is under serious threats from many different stressors, you know, and that includes increasing population uh, that, you know, leads to degradation of uh, water quality of Manila Bay, you know, and, uh, and all other uh, uh, factors, you know, that put uh, stress you know, on Manila Bay. Um, let's see, can I, is this, a, is this a clicker that I can, yeah, can I? Oh yeah, okay. Oh, oh. Where should I point this? Here? There. Uh, ah, okay, sorry. All right. Oh, did I turn it off? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so that's the uh, project overview. And uh, the master plan guiding principles, you know, are, you know, very much like many other planning exercises that we have. You know, we have to be very integrative and holistic in our approach. And uh, especially so for Manila Bay, it has to be, you know, there has to be um, ecosystem-based and, of course, participatory and stakeholder-driven. As I said, you know, this is very much, you know, about the stakeholders, you know, more than anything else and uh, without which, we don't know really how to move this forward, you know, and ensure that this will be successfully implemented. And this is science-based, and that is why, you know, we are here as well. We want to hear from you because you are, you know, you are the people from science who can provide more inputs and guidance, you know, in this uh, master planning exercise. And um, alignment with ambition, not in PDP, Mandamus, etc. So, again, this is also in response, you know, to... Uh, facilitate the intent of, uh, at the achievement of the intent of the writ of Mandamus, you know, to clean up Manila Bay and to ensure that it is, uh, you know, it is useful to uh, everyone, you know, over the long term. And of course, this is also supportive of the many different uh, policy directions, plans, you know, that we have in the country. We recognize how important Manila Bay is as a resource that contributes to the achievement of our different uh, socioeconomic development goals, you know, especially those that are uh, embodied in the Philippine Development uh, Philippine Development Plan. Um, in uh, you know, in brief, this is uh, this is the entire timeline for the development of the master plan, and as you can see, we are already at this particular stage, you know. Uh, right about, yeah, you know, right about here, you know, where we're trying to, uh, again, as I said, you know, refine the, uh, refine the master plan, the first version of which came out in May, in May 10, you know, this year. So, uh, you know, as I was saying, in October um, 10th, we hope to submit to NEDA a revised version of this, uh, of this master plan, most of which I will be presenting here. 
And then after that comes the, um, uh, comes the continuous updating of the master plan together with the development of the action plan or the implementation, implementation plan, not together with the investment plan for the uh, master plan. And um, the six strategic goals of, uh, of the master plan includes uh, promoting inclusive growth, um, improving the informal settlement conditions, disaster reduction and climate change adaptation, improve improving the water quality in the bay and protecting the ecosystems within the bay. So ito yung, ano, ito yung anim na strategic goals, you know, that um, we are aiming at, you know, and that uh, the master plan is being designed for. And um, yeah, um, ito yung, I mean, this is, this is the, these are the very reasons why, you know, why uh, we want uh, Manila Bay to, uh, you know, to be, uh, uh, that why the uh, restoration of Manila Bay, you know, uh, will have to be facilitated by the master plan, you know, because of these uh, different problems, problems on solid waste that, that dumps all those garbage in the bay, and then uh, the people that are exposed to flooding, especially coastal flooding, and then the, um, uh, the decreasing natural uh, habitats, the uh, poor settlement conditions, especially those located in hazard areas, and then the declining uh, water quality in the bay, and then of course uh, the pollution coming from uh, different sources, and then the decreasing uh, fish stock uh, biomass in the in the bay. And all this is happening, you know, all this all these are happening. Uh, uh, that undermine, no, undermines the that undermine the uh, the value of Manila Bay to uh, the, the Philippines, you know, uh, Philippine economy and uh, the society. Oops, ah, sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, right now, you know, right now, uh, what we have in terms of. Uh, current institutional arrangement is that uh, Manila Bay Coordinating Office, office MBCO is supporting the Mandamas agencies, you know, for uh, complying with their different mandates, you know, as specified in the Mandamas order. And then, uh, and uh, we have um, a representative here. And then, um, yes, uh, the Supreme Court, you know, for Mandamas agencies, you know, uh, the 13 different agencies, and then uh, right now, there is no oversight for agencies outside of Mandamos, and of course, uh, we know that NEDA is spearheading the development of the uh, the development of master plan, and uh, 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 by virtue of Administrative Order 16, we have the uh, Manila Bay Task Force, and uh, this is in relation to the cleanup program, you know, being uh, implemented by uh, the Office of the President through the. Uh, the Department of Environment and Natural and Natural Resources, and uh, uh, we are working, you know, very closely with uh, the Manila Bay Task Force because we we realize that a lot of what has to be done and a lot of what has to be in the master plan over the short term are already being undertaken and being implemented by the task force, and you know it is but uh, logical that we work with them so that you know whatever they accomplish over the next three to six years are sustained over the long term by the master plan so you know this is a uh, you know we have a very close uh, interfacing you know with the uh, manila bay task force the key result areas that they have you know uh, that they are trying to achieve those are you know well uh, 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 entrained you know in the process by which we are fine-tuning the master plan um, this is in brief uh, the uh, the uh, the way you know the way we um, uh, we try to address the different concerns um, in um, in in the master plan we are trying to address the, the six strategic uh, goals that I mentioned about and uh, for each of those uh, strategic goals we have identified key indicators no. So ito yung mga indicators that we have here right now. We have 10 key indicators. And um, uh, these indicators are uh, related to uh, targets. No? May mga targets tayo ng bawat indicators. And these are targets that are mostly set by, uh, by the government. No? And uh, 
ito yung you know this is what we're trying to aim at no so yung yung master plan is not trying to aim at anything new you know but uh, we are trying to um, make sure that the master plan will facilitate the achievement of this uh, government set targets no for the different indicators and then um, uh, for all these indicators, we, uh, we set up the uh, base case values no, of these indicators. And uh, uh, from this base case, we projected what will be the values of these indicators in 2022, 2030, and 2040. And uh, uh, assuming that, assuming that uh, we don't have, you know, we don't do anything or, you know, assuming that we don't have the master plan, okay? The value of these indicators in 2040 is going to be what we refer to as the reference case. And you know, if we compare now the reference case with the target indicators, then we are able to estimate the gap, you know, between uh, the gap between the targets, you know, in twenty in twenty forty. Now you will see here middle ground, you know, because um, in, in the beginning as we build our strategies, you know, in this master plan we considered three uh, future uh, plausible, you know, uh, global scenarios, okay? And uh, th that includes, you know, uh, the economic, the, the projected economic conditions, you know, in, uh, in, in 2040 and uh, as well as the, um, the projected climate, you know, conditions at that time. And uh, well, what we see here, what you see here now is that uh, based on our strategic uh, strat strategy building process, we decided that, you know, the middle scenario is the scenario that we believe, you know, is most, uh, most practical and most uh, logical for us to pursue. And therefore, you know, you, you will see here that the reference case uh, values of the indicators are actually for the middle scenarios. And this is... Uh, Mostly, you know, very, very, very close to the business as usual scenarios, you know, of the economy and of the climate change, you know, considering that uh, we only have to work with 20 years, you know, as the planning horizon. Okay. Now, uh, with this, with these gaps, you know, ito na yung naging target, no? Ito yung tina-target namin ngayon. This, this represents now the 100% target, you know, that we want to achieve uh, once the, uh, the the master plan is implemented. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Okay, now here are the 10 uh, uh, indicators that we have identified, you know, young pollution load of BOD entering Manila Bay and PO4 entering Manila Bay and then a percentage of Manila Bay monitoring stations that meet the Class SB water guideline values for fecal coliform. And then solid waste diversion rate. Uh, solid waste diversion rate is just the uh, the amount of garbage, you know, that uh, does not end up in sanitary landfills, no? Okay, as its final destination. In other words, we, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, if we if things work out, you know, gusto natin most of the uh, biodegradables are separated and does not end up in the landfill. Most of the recyclables, you know, and the reusable you know, uh, materials also are not, you know, going to end up in uh, in landfills, you know, and mapunta lang sana doon yung mga residuals talaga na wala nang, you know, wala nang pagkagamitan and wala nang ibang mapag, uh, ma, eh, ma, wala, wala nang ibang gamit, no, and hindi na mapaprocess into something else more useful. And then, number of open dump sites, and then area protected natural habitats, wild uh, fish stock biomass, Number of people exposed to coastal flooding and uh, encroachment of informal settlements and legal easement and uh, poverty, poverty incidents. So these are the targets you know we're trying to that we're trying to address. And um, what you'll see here is the base case values of these indicators. These are the target uh, you know targets of uh, these different indicators. As I said, mostly uh, from government, not targets. And then. Uh, this is the value of the reference case in the middle ground scenario, and this is a gap. Okay, and as I said, these gaps are now the uh, are now the effective uh, target you know, uh, values of the indicators that uh, we're trying to that we're trying to address. You know, and this constitute. Oops, ah, okay, sorry. And uh, as I mentioned, you know this. These are now what we consider to be as the 100% you know, target, okay, that we want to achieve. 
Okay, for monitoring purposes, uh, this uh, you know when we refer to the 100% uh, target, you know, ito yon yung mga values for the indicators that we want you know to um, to achieve. And uh <coughs> based on the strategy building process that we undertook, you know, we identified six um, six major. Uh, um, package of uh, measures, you know, thematic package, and marami uh, na kami measures, you know, uh, but uh, we're still open, you know, to more appropriate terms for this, but uh, I mean, suffice it to say for now, you know, that these are six uh, thematic packages of, uh, of uh, program activities and uh, projects, or what we refer to as PAPs, you know? Uh, we have one for improving management of natural protected areas, improving solid waste management, one for reducing pollution load, one for addressing the concerns of informal settlements, in particular in easements, and then implementing disaster risk uh, management programs and uh, projects. Uh, yeah, there is a CCA built in right there, no? And then enforcing sustainable fisheries. So ito yung anim, no? These are the, the prime, the main, the major no, uh, thematic package of props. And uh, supplementing, you know, supplementary to all of this, we have two important uh, uh, thematic packages then, you know, yung, uh, promoting environmental sound development. You will see later what, uh, what is included or what are included in these uh, uh, themes. And then uh, decongesting, decongesting Metro Manila. You can consider itong mga ito you know as um, you know as a parang you know precondition or as a requirement you know if you want if you want this to be effective and uh, you know generate for us the impacts that we are uh, expecting from them you know th this has to kumbaga you know, this has to exist at the same time or if we want to ensure that these that these different uh, thematic packages are sustainable over the long term you know, we expect that uh, we expect that this, this. <coughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, so you know, if we expect this to be sustainable over the long term, you know, uh, we we you know we. Uh, we expect that this two will be set in place so that you know so that that. Sustainability, ca sustainability can be in, uh, ensured, and then ito yung mga you know, th this is the works na merong institutional setup which is very important. You know, I'm not saying that these are not you know as important as the rest of the other measures, but uh, you know, in every uh, master plan and uh, implementing uh, uh, implementing plan, you have this institutional setup, capacity building. And then monitoring and evaluation, and then of course the finance financing. Uh? Huh? Okay, so tanaw don sa ano thematic packages. Okay, number one, improving management of protected areas. Uh, we have um, between level one uh, pops na siyang sabi namin strengthen protection of remaining habitats in in Manila Bay. And under this, you uh, level two PAPs, conduct of uh, biodiversity and ecological assessment of uh, of Manila Bay. No, uh, I think the the last one that we had was in comprehensive one was in the 90s, early 90s. No, and then develop a harmonized habitat conservation strategy for for uh, for Manila Bay. And then um, increase coverage of critical habitats through restoration and protection of intertidal areas and uh, disaster reduction zones. No? And then this the level two paths related to that is implementing DRR, critical habitat restoration and monitoring projects. And then uh, providing strict and consistent protection to actively restored, uh, actively restored habitats. And uh, on the thematic uh, package two, improving solid waste management, ito yung kasamang mga pubs yan, increase capacities of sanitary landfills. So what we have now, 
ang, uh, uh, ang, ang intention is to increase yung, yung capacity ng existing sanitary landfill now, which is, of course, uh, easier to do than uh, build new ones. Okay. And then um, construction of regional transfer stations and more materials recovery facility. And this is to, uh, this is to facilitate the, uh, the uh, increase in diversion rate, no? Para hindi lahat pupunta sa landfill, eh, no? Kung baga merong mag intercept na facilities to separate those that can still be recycled and reused, no? And uh, that is the purpose of, uh, of constructing more regional transfer stations, no? And as you see, this is in transition to uh, sanitary landfills and other final destinations. And then construction of large-scale large composting uh, facilities, okay, to uh, handle the biodegradable uh, uh, part of the uh, uh, waste that are being generated, and then implement waste to energy projects, such as uh, you know refuse derived fuel uh, project, biodigesters, thermal and non-thermal technology. And then soft measures such as incentives for LGUs to increase diversion rates, strict enforcement of waste segregation. So I mean, most of the soft measures in all the thematic packages are actually on improving implementation and enforcement. No? Because uh naman tayo mga ganda ng, ano, no? mga ganda ng policies and uh, programs you just need to uh, you know, work, uh, you know, work some more on the implementation um, you know, and on the enforcement uh, aspect of uh, uh, in relation to those uh, policies and programs. And then, uh, yeah, ito yung uh, ban on single-use uh, plastics. You know, I think there is already a proposal on this, you know, a bill. And then policy on extended producer's responsibility. And then uh, incentive for recycling industries and institutional capacity building. Yung policy on extended pro uh, producers' responsibility is just, you know, to put the responsibility on the manufacturers, you know, on how to handle yung kanilang mga, uh, yung mga waste generated by their products, yung mga packaging nila, you know. They should be made responsible for handling them, you know. Hindi yung iaasa na lang sa, uh, sa government, you know, to handle them. Okay. And then uh, third, reducing pollution load, and uh, the one of the major pop here, level one expansion of sewerage coverage for management of domestic wastewater, and uh, uh, this includes full coverage of Metro Manila by 2026. And this is the uh, this is the accelerated. No, this is the accelerated target. You know uh, uh, that was set. You know with the uh, Manila Bay Task Force. No, that is an I nasa thirty, oh, thirty 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 five yung ano yun, no? yung original na target nila na ma, ma coverage full in full yung Metro Manila by twenty thirty five. Ginawa ng twenty twenty six yan. No, in accelerate nila. And then seventy five coverage of coastal LGUs and key cities by twenty forty. And then all existing uh, wastewater treatment uh, and recycling plants and STPs are all uh, compliant, you know, to this existing standards. And then all structures directly discharging untreated effluents to water bodies, water bodies are removed. And of course, the second level, uh, second first level is uh, PAP is the septage management full coverage of clustered LGUs by 2030. And this is in recognition of the difficulty and the limitations of individual LGUs to set up their own septage management facilities. So, ang, ano, ang nakikita namin dito is it's best to, uh, to have clusters of LGUs, you know, to develop its respective uh, 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 sewage, ma sub uh, septage management uh, facilities. Hindi na kasi obra si malabanan, eh, no? Uh, walang pinupuntahan yung kinukolekta nila. Okay, and then um, ito pa yung additional treatment of effluents from all point sources, commercial, industrial, and institutional. Uh, again, you know, uh, it's thi <coughs> this is mostly a matter of what? A matter of enforcement, no? <coughs> Kasi dapat meron silang sarili nila. And then control of offshore pollution sources. Ito yung isang hindi nababantayan, no? The waste are being dumped by uh, by uh, 
sea vessels, no? ocean going vessels, and then decision support systems for water quality management of uh, Manila Bay, and uh, again, IEC, capacity development of the various stakeholders and policy reforms. <coughs> Excuse me. Fourth, addressing concerns of informal, informal settlements, in easements. So again, uh, it's a malaking problem ito, ano, not only because they are in hazard's way or in harm's way, but uh, they are also, uh, you know, to some degree, some extent, the sources of pollution no, in, uh, in the waterways. So <coughs> the paths included here are increase the supply of affordable housing, Malapit ng maubos ang boses ko. <laughs> For more than 40 years of lecturing, you know, this is where I am now. My voice is almost gone. I used to lecture. I can lecture whole day. You know, during during my early days, ano lang ito, para lang ma <coughs> mawala yung katinang lalumunan ko. You know, I used, to, I used to hold by myself one complete training course for the DNR, you know. And not just really, uh, one week to ten days. I can do that at that time. No? But for now, you know, lapang isang oras. Eh, no? <coughs> lumalabas na yung ano, lumalabas na yung sira ng lalamon, vocal cords natin. Anyway. So, increase the supply of affordable housing for uh, informal settlers, no? informal settlers' families. And then uh, reduce the motivation for people to live in uh, informal settlements. And this is usually, you know, this is usually uh, what we want. This is this is what we want to address. Because and dami ng programa no to relocate, to improve, you know, etc. No, pero bumabalik din eh, no? Balik ng balik na dadagdagan pa no? I mean, we did it also in Makiling, you know, in Mount Makiling during the martial law time. We removed all the informal settlers in Mount Makiling, but then you know. Uh, we did not have these incentive mechanisms or what disincentive mechanisms, you know, for their return. So, ang nangyari, bumalik lang sila kasama pa yung mga kaibigan nila. Okay, <coughs> mga bagong kaibigan. All right, and then uh, policy reform and improvement, no, uh, improvement of enforcement of existing laws. Okay, specifically on land development and construction of buildings and infrastructure. And then um, compelling developers not to develop the required 10, 20% of their development for socialized housing. So, meron yan, alam yan. So, pag meron may project na may meron siyang condo na tinatayo, 20% dapat nung units niya ay for socialized housing. Pero hindi, hindi I think you know, it's not really being enforced. And then five, implementing DRR programs and projects uh, this is where Hans is going to help us, you know. This is perhaps one of the most difficult uh, thematic package, you know, that we're working on, okay. Uh, uh, simply because, you know, the, the understanding, the understanding on the, uh, understanding on the problem at hand, you know, coastal flooding, that is due to uh, um, uh, land subsidence and uh, increasing sea level and then the fluvial, you know, fluvial, uh, uh, flooding, so masyadong complicated siya, no? And yet, we don't really have a full, uh, you know, assessment on hand or at hand, okay? Kasi hindi part ng project yung funding for primary assessments, you know, of these many different studies that should have been done, you know, before we can come up with a, uh, we, ca we can come up with a suitable, you know, flood mitigation plan. All right. So anyway, Number one, no clearing of obstructions in waterways or so low hanging fruit yan and damin yan, no, particularly along uh, along the Angat River, you know, just before they enter Manila Bay, you know, and damin yan, mga fish mga fish ponds that already encroached, okay? And then capacity building that is needed no, uh, for G LGAs and GAs, children, youth, you know, so all those works, you know, IEC, evaluation and improvement of DRR facilities, you know, and so on. So I guess I have less than five minutes, so I'll have to uh, uh, 
accelerate my presentation and then uh, establishment of a Manila Bay Resiliency Fund for coastal LGUs to support incentives for people businesses to move out of hazard zones and then provide incentives to honor owners of marginal fish ponds to sell to government you know yung um, yung kanila mga fish ponds that are now becoming uh, uh, unusable no for uh, whatever coastal uh, protection strategy is necessary no okay so yung resiliency fund parang familiar ba kayo sa people survival fund no parang ganun yung nakikita namin dito that we need to set up one for the coastal LGUs of Manila Bay so that the uh, those are that are perennially and uh, seemingly permanently affected by flooding you know can have a uh, an alternative you know for uh, moving out of their areas you know and uh, i mean to a better place you know <coughs> and then uh, comprehensive coastal flood uh, management uh, management planning this is this is what we were talking about no lahat ng mga ma mahalagang study na yan, no, wala pang, wala pang, ano, wala pang na, na, nagawa, you know, and uh, that's what, you know, this thematic, this, this pop is going to include, no? And then development projects for, this is now for enforcing sustainable fisheries development for top 10 fish species, you know, so may mga, may mga second level na, na mga pops dyan, develop policies, no? Seasonal fishery closure, establish strategic fishery monitoring and database management, develop rules and regulations on fisheries in Manila Bay. And then enhance enhancement of fish stock biomass, develop community-based fisheries and aquaculture management plan, program to reduce fishing pressures uh, on shallow demersal fish, and uh, IEC. And then promoting environmentally sound development. This includes proper implementation and strict enforcement of existing policies and programs, uh, particularly related to the establishment of uh, um, small water impounding system, establishment of soil conservation techno demo farm, implement agri wastewater treatment, ensure implementation of UDHA, uh, adherence to sustainable tourism development principles, you know. So basically, these are more enforcing what we have now. And then development of new policies and standards, such as those governing development of rating system and incentives for green development, the passage of National Land Use Act, improved regulation of land conversion, especially of agri to other uses, agricultural land to other uses, and then enforcing local ordinances. That includes the LUP and zoning. Okay, tapos na daw ako. Uh, last na to, <laughs> sorry. Eight, ayan, ito na yung last. No? Enforcing sustainable fisheries. Ah, sorry, hindi ito enforcing sustainable fisheries. No? Hindi ko na natama yan. Uh, that is um, decongesting Metro Manila. Okay? Decongesting Metro Manila, which is this one. Okay? Uh, the first level pop is this de decongest decongesting Metro Manila development of policies and guidelines. This include Enhance land use efficiency, passage of National Land Use Act, develop sustainable tourism product, establish carrying capacity of 36 coastal LGUs, redevelopment densification in filling, and then transfer of government offices and uh, NGC and reverse migration. So, yun yun. And meron pa sana papakita, which is very important, yung zoning framework but uh, you know I can I can if you ask you know if you ask that later so open form I can show this to you okay so for now uh, thank you very much and um, <laughs> JJ will ask will, will help me <laughs> field your questions okay so thank you again thank you very much dr. Cruz our next speaker is a physical oceanographer, professor, and current director of the UP Marine Science Institute. She uses remote sensing and modeling to explore ocean physics and its, and its effects on productivity and diversity. She is currently the chair of the CHED Technical Committee on Marine Science and a member of the National Panel of Technical Experts for the Climate Change Commission. 
She is also a member of the International Scientific Steering Committee of the GEO Blue Planet Initiative and Future Earth Coasts Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Dr. Laura T. Deville. Uh, magandang umaga po sa lahat. Maikli lang to. Uh, meron akong workshop na ina-attendan, kaya marami kong ganito. Um, ay, bakit to Miguel? Dapat tuloy-tuloy lang yan. Uh, uh, dito lang ko para ibahagi ko ano yung mga nangyari noong Marso at Abril. Nagkita-kita ang tatlong CU, uh, Los Baños, Diliman at Manila para mapag-usapan kung ano ang maitutulong sa rehabilitasyon ng Manila Bay. So, uh, kaya ko sinimulan yung toko para pakita ito kasi ang unang-una naming naging conclusion ay kailangan talaga maibahagi sa madla na maganda pa ang Manila Bay. No? Nabuhay na buhay pa siya at marami siyang binibigay para sa tao. Kasi napakadali na baliwalain siya. It's so easy to just give up on Manila Bay if you do not realize how beautiful it still is that is still full of life, that it provides life for a lot of people. Mm? So our, the first conclusion of the Tri-Campus meeting was we have to make the people realize that Manila Bay is still very beautiful and it's still very much alive. So we have to come up, uh, as, as a university, we have to come up with that, uh, whether it's a book, a uh, show, uh, a lot of blogs, videos, whatever, online presence to show the different aspects of Manila Bay that are still very much beautiful and alive. No, so this is a um, video of somebody of a ship coming into Manila Bay, and as you see, it's not the trash laden dark waters that are smelly that that confronts you when you go into Manila Bay. It's actually very, very beautiful. Okay, so. Um, so that's the first one, no? Buhay na buhay si Manila Bay. No? I think it will be much harder to do reclamation, for example, if you know that you're killing something that's beautiful when you do that. It's so easy to just put land there or additional soil there if you think it's already dead. No? So that, I think that has to be the first one. The second one, um, oops, next slide, please. Ayaw eh. Yung down. Yun. Uh, many sectors already have a lot of data that can actually help. So Manila and Los Baños and Diliman have had a lot of studies around Manila Bay or inside Manila Bay itself. And all this can be gathered together to show the state of knowledge. Uh, and maybe the other SUCs or HEIs surrounding Manila Bay have also had small studies that they can contribute. You know, I think we have to gather all of that. Uh, there is no one single database for all the data that we know of Manila Bay. And data from Manila Bay dates all the way back to the Spanish time. Um, for example, sa uh, Ateneo, you know, so Man Manila Observatory should have a lot of data of Manila Bay because of the galleon trades. So we should have to take a look at those as well. And then finally, yeah, uh, we have to involve the public. And everything that I'm glad that Doc Rex, idol ko yan eh, that had uh, the talk before me because he already outlined the science behind what I'm trying to say to involve the public. No, um, each of those that he said earlier, maybe except number five, are actually should be told to the public in the following manner. Uh, all the science and all the policies that need to be made behind what needs to be done has already been outlined, but what we need to show the public is what's happening. And what's happening is a perception thing. So the first thing that, the, the, first, uh, the first fight was making sure it looks clean, right? So see no evil. So that's why the trash and all that needs to be done. That's why number two uh, in Dr. X talk was is very prominent. You know, how to deal with trash, how to deal with solid trash, uh, to make also the industry responsible for collecting their own trash, not just the government and so on. That goes to number two, because that's the very perceptible. 
The next one is smell no evil. <laughs> No, it has to smell good. It cannot be that when you go through the rivers of Manila, you know you're crossing Pasig River, or that when you're near Rojas Boulevard, you smell the Manila, that side of Manila Bay that's smelly, or in Cavite area. That has to change. But all that, the science behind that is number three, number four, of what Doc Rex was saying, no? Pollu pollution control, sewage control, effluent control, all of that is actually in number two. So you have to have a rating, say in the in online and on print media, showing how how good we've gone to the see no evil, how good we've gone to the smell no evil. No, so if you uh, there was one uh, study in Los Banos, so it's really really good because they were trying to find. Uh, use large data sets in order to predict the overturning of Laguna de Bay. No? So they kept using temperature, salinity, wind, everything that they're trying to predict when there it's there's going to be an overturn. And then they realized, the computer science uh, section of UPLB realized they could actually gather tweets of people or in FB saying that they're starting to smell something. So sad faces, they collected the sad faces, they collected the, it smells, it, they collect mabaho, they collected the, this, harvested all the tweets and harvested all the Facebook for this. And they saw that the moment that goes up, one or two days later, it will overturn. So the humans you know, are surrounding the area are actually perceiving what the science is trying to predict, which is the overturn. So it's making use of citizen science. No? So there are more innovative ways to do that. Um, and to smell no evil, I think, we should involve the, the public. And then, and then I will age myself. I used to be able to swim in Manila Bay. I remember the times when it's just 30 minutes away from Diliman. So when it's vacation time, you ride the Jeep to Rojas, there's some stairs going down there, and you can actually swim. So if you can swim, that means you're actually taking care of the arrest that Doc Rex said earlier, no? Biological pollution, anything that will make you itch, anything that will make you sick. If you can already swim in it, then it's clean, no? So if you have people that are reporting that it's safe to swim there, you know, so UP Manila can play a big function in this. DNR can play a big function in this. Coast Guard can play a function in this. When they're starting to report that E. coli is going down, the, all the other, col there's some cholera there too, uh, that all that's going down, then, and you can swim in it, then that's a success, right? So that's the third. And then the last one, the fourth one, is if you can eat from it. Um, why is it the last? Because that's the least perceptible of all. People actually eat from it now. There's a lot of consumption. There's a lot of production in Manila Bay. But the heavy metal content of that fish is quite high. So pag kinuha niyo yung heavy metal sa tissue, mataas siya. So yun yung hardest. Uh, and it, that's part of Doc Rex's uh, presentation not just the biological effluent, but actually make all the factories uh, nation internationally standard. Kasi pati yung heavy metal na effluent makokontrol. But we need to show that if we do all that jargon that we understand uh, through Doc Rex's presentation, but to show that to the public that that's what's been happening, the public response will not be that warm. They're like, yeah, whatever. But if you s say, if you have a rating of the s sea, smell, can you swim, can you eat, then I think that's easy for them to consume and say, okay, the government and the rest of the academic world is doing something about it. Uh, so I guess uh, make use of the power of the media as well to make this happen. So yun lang yun. Last lang, no sa lahat ng sinabi ni Doc Rex, May isa lang akong want to add. Um, there's this problem of easement in the entire country and definitely in Manila Bay because the current law is 
3 meters easement for urban, 40 meters for forested, and then 10 meters somewhere in between, depending on development. Mo. There's no scientific basis for that. Right? Uh, that, was, that was done from the Spanish era. There's no, no scientific basis of that. What should be the basis is slope. You know, if you, how high are you from sea level? If you don't want to get hit by sea level rise, you know that the prediction is about one to two meters, then you have the first houses or any establishment should be two meters above sea level. If that means 40 meters, 100 meters, or just one meter, it depends on the place. And then if you want to make sure you're not touched by storm surge, so the storm surge of s storms coming from uh, West Philippine Sea is about three, signal number three. That's equivalent to about nine, eight feet of storm surge. So you have to have at least three meters above sea level if you don't want to get hit by a storm surge, right? So, and if you don't want to get hit by a tsunami, we haven't had one from the West Philippine Sea for a while, but if you look at the 1600 records, there have been huge ones that have wiped out complete communities in Zambales. So if you take that into consideration, maybe you should have a five meter above sea level easement. What does that mean? All your hospitals, schools, evacuation area should be above that height. It cannot be below that because that's where people will go in case of an emergency. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Laura T. David. Our next speaker was born in 1967 and is a biogeographer. He received his Bachelor of Science from the University of the Philippines, Visayas, in 1988, where he majored in aquaculture. He then proceeded to graduate school as a scholar in the Marine Sciences Program with a focus on studying mollusks at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Upon receiving his master's degree in 1993, he worked in setting up the reef-based global coral reef databases with ICLARM, now World Fish Center. He received his PhD in 2004 from James Cook University in Australia, where he did a thesis on the biogeography of coral reef shore gastropods. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for IESM's very own Dr. Benjamin M. Vallejo, Jr. Hello, uh, morning, uh, so I was aged from the beginning. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'll give a talk uh, talk on the biodiversity debate. No? Uh, just a word of advice, uh, underestimated um, biodiversity in Manila Bay, which means it's still uh, a, a challenge for, for scientific studies. Okay, so uh, physical geography, I'll just go through this quite quickly because uh, I think we'll never talk more about the geography of the bay. So anyway, it's a semi-enclosed estuary. Uh, it's quite large for an estuary, uh, at least for an archipelagic country. Uh, it's gently sloping, one meet meter per kilometer gradient, just like any estuary. And the uh, depth is about 17 meters on average. So it is actually a uh, the bay bay. Uh, you can, 70 meters is shallow for scuba divers. You can easily dive to the bottom, but it's full of mud. So, and the watershed essentially is, uh, is the whole, uh, covers several uh, provinces, half of Bataan, Pampanga, Bulacan, NCR, and the whole of Pizal, parts of Laguna, and the whole of Cavite, and the whole of Nueva e Ecija, and parts of Tarlac. Even Zambales. So it's a uh, watershed is quite big. So that's the catchment area of the bay. So I think you're quite familiar with Google Earth. Well, if you can Google Earth the bay, and you'll see something like this. Now, uh, Kolohi Bay is a volcano. Makikita niyo lang from some shape ng vulkan niyo na. There's a lot of volcanoes around this area, especially on Bataan Peninsula and in the Pico de Loro area in. 
What we've been studying, our research team has been studying the Manila Bay Harbor region for more than a decade. Uh, so from the North Harbor down to the Family Point Naval Base and beyond, we were studying this since 2006, I think. So we have a fairly good data baseline for the harbor, at least for the harbor of Manila. And a melody later on will talk uh, to you about uh, what we have found out in certain aspects of the harbor's ecology. So Manila Bay, as uh, Doc Lau told us earlier, has been studied since the Spanish colonial period. Actually, there's a lot of material, uh, especially in the UST Museum. So if somebody would like to go there and look at the material in the UST Museum, uh, you would find out that some of the collected uh, marine uh, samples there were from the from the Manila Bay. So, so uh, American scientists have studied the fisheries starting uh, when they came here. They occupied the country in 1902. And when we became an independent country, uh, we were much of our research focused on fisheries, aquaculture, and more lately on e oceanography of the Bay. And pollution started to become a big issue in the 1950s. And we started our biological invasion work in 2005. So, the major environmental issues, uh, the number one really is land reclamation and, con and conversion. Not just reclamation of the foreshore of the bay, but also what's happening uh, in the watershed. Uh, acidification of coastal water, harmful algal blooms have been studied here in Manila Bay for four decades, I think. Sea level rise, pollution, non-indigenous species. Shallow water hypoxia, there'll always be a fish kill on the third week of November, especially in the harbor. Uh, after all these years of looking at the harbor, we can advise that we better start uh, preparing for the fish kill on the third week of November. And of course, nat natural hazards to human communities. Reclamation remains as the biggest uh, changer of the coastal and the shore ecosystem because you're going to really cover the shore with, uh, with built up areas. And that would affect water circulation, among others. And you can see this if you go to the uh, Yacht Club Marina, which is uh, affected by strong waves every time there is the Habagat because the reclamation has tended to funnel much of the water to the Yacht Club Basin. I was told by the Yacht Club people about that. And of course, during those low oxygen uh, episodes, you'd see fish floating in the water. You would see this probably around first week of December, based on our observations. The major habitats, I think uh, Dr. Rene Rowan will talk to you more about it. Uh, sea grasses, mangroves, mud flats, Coastal lagoons, which are almost non-existent now. Navotas was one big coastal lagoon. Uh, the Dagat Dagatan Lagoon, but uh, it has been reclaimed. Uh, sandy beaches used to be the major tourist attraction, but you'd only find it probably along the play. The nice ones are within the Philippine Marine Base, which are not open to the tourists in uh, Ternate. Those are the last beaches that are good enough to swim in. Now, uh, the city of Manila was named after the Milabs, Kifu for the Hind of Philosea. And ironically, there's no Milab plant within the city of Manila right now. So, one of the proposals to Mayor Isco is well, the, perhaps we can reintroduce it symbolically to the city. So we're asking uh, Dr. Georgian Primavera if she could help out. But we have to look at the environmental conditions of the, the shoreline of mm, the city of Manila, which has much changed since the time of Raha Sulaiman. <laughs> so uh, you just can't put a mangrove tree there and expect it to grow. We really have to look if it's still suitable. The irony is there are more milled plants in Singapore. Uh, and that's why when I visit, uh, I visit, when we had a conference there with my uh, colleagues from NUS, I told them you better rename Singapore as Manila because they're using the plant to, sh to stabilize the shoreline. There are more milad plants in Singapore, so maybe my milad is Singapore now. So ironically, we have to bring it back to our, to our capital city. 
So this is the area after the cleanup. Uh, there's still a few pieces of trash floating. As you can see, the beach is made of shells, and that really shows you the, the big component of biodiversity in any marine ecosystem. It's actually the mollusks. So uh, almost all of the, the beach sand here is made of shells, specifically, f specifically from, uh, from the venerated clams in Manghalaan and the Anadara clams, or Batoto in Tagalog, or Lutod in Hiligaynes. <laughs> uh, you would find it uh, in the shallows of Manila Bay. Now, uh, as Doc Lau told us, it's not, Manila Bay isn't dead, it's beautiful. Okay? This is Sisiman Cove in Marivelos, uh, least known tourist destination. Uh, See, so it's almost like Batanos. <laughs> it's only a few hours drive. And a lot of the material in the National Museum of Natural History, the mollusk material, came from the Seaman Cove. So I went there, but unfortunately, the waves were too rough for, for doing a shore service or just took my pictures. So it's a and according to the BNR, that's the only beach in the tourist beach in Manila Bay that has met the standard for swimming in less than 100 most probable number of qualified bacteria. Okay, so Seaman Cove is still an uh, anchorage for fishing boats that go to the Panatag Shoal. So it's a nice place. The Akumiri man. I took that, uh, when I started my sabbatical, I took that picture immediately. <laughs> so it's a recent photo. Anyway. So this is the picture for my please picture. <laughs> and remember that they just off Baklara, look at what the people are doing, they're collecting shells. So as you can see, they're collecting halaan, to be more exact. So as you can see, uh, it's a very productive mud flat. Yeah, this is just off Paranaque. Uh, where, where Baklaran is now, okay? You can reclaim the part of Baklaran. It's the Toyota Manila Bay. Na, na, uh, uh, no. That's where it is. And uh, thanks to the WVCP President Mike Lu, World Bird Clubs, for sharing us this picture. You can see the pictures of the abuses or spirits from the, from the mud flats near Paranaque Los Pinos. And this is Baseco Beach, something that we took a picture recently after at the clean up. So anyway, I'll just, maybe, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll just go through this quite quickly. Now what are we doing in this modern uh, ecology team? Uh, and when are we talking more about it? So we've been doing the monitoring since more than 2006. Pa, eh? using uh, inexpensive, ways, uh, inexpensive ways to detect fouling organisms. So we we'll do that. We have deployed more than 200 collectors in the last 10 years. Some of them were eaten by fish. These are the recent ones we took. We sponge to Nakikita. Hopefully that's an indicator of increasing of improving water quality. And we looked at the non-indigenous species. Melody will talk to you more about it. And this is, if you look up in the microscope, the founders will look like this. It's a barnacle and uh, a calcareous tube. <laughs> the white thing there is a calcareous tube. These are uh, live samples. We discovered all sorts of crabs and shrimps that we still need to identify. <laughs> this is a protruded crab, a limasag in Tagalog or kasag in the Hisayan languages. <laughs> a pelumon shrimp, pelumonid. And of course, all of the foreign species that were introduced here deliberately or indeliberately. And the one that's really documented as invasive is Mytola Chiruana, which is the focus of our studies in its uh, 
population genetics and evolutionary genetics recently on its ecology. It came from Brazil, first recorded in 2014. Yeah. So anyway, uh, much of the biodiversity along the harbor area are really farmers. Some of the farmers are edible, like the tahon. Some are of interest as possible biological indicators for improving or deteriorating environmental quality. So this will present a lot of possibilities to students for marine science or biology students or ecology students to look at the different tolerances of all of these farming species, especially the polychaetes. Okay? Polychaetes are one of the best indicators for changing environments, in changing environmental conditions in the ocean, but there are very few people who are studying it. Uh, you can count them with the fingers, okay, the polychaetes. twins. Now, polychaetes and the invasive species of the home. <laughs> no species that we're, we're detecting, every year we detect one indigenous species, about two or three a year. And that's the truth. And these are the students from UP Manila who we don't sleep just to count the number of farmers on the plates. <laughs> <laughs> so genetics goals, uh, the, the founding goals, okay, uh, they've been doing a lot of this work and a lot of their, uh, we have come up with several international publications from the work of these uh, undergrad students from UP Manila. So the latest one, which we expect to come out in the year, uh, documents all the new farmers that came in in the last two years. As you can see, the bay isn't dead. Uh, that's one thing that has to be made clear, it's not dead. You know, there's a lot of things there. Actually, it actually is an inter the bay is an interesting place to study marine biology. You don't need to go to far off places just to find an interesting marine ecosystem. So if you go to La Papachea, you would find something interesting. If you're interested in fish, you have a seagrass fish community there without the seagrass. Again, so that is another thing that's an interesting science question. How can we find these uh, high dive, uh, a lot of seagrass-loving fish, which are not, and the seagrass isn't there, okay? Uh, there might be some uh, explanation for that. Now, uh, Manila Bay, if you look at the, if you, if you do research in marine dive biodiversity da databases, uh, you can actually go, uh, you can actually search according in many lenses and you'd find a list of all the species of tropical marine organisms that has the, the, se the Latin name Manilensis, which means it was first caught or described from Manila Bay. An example would be the Manila Bay puffer fish, which is our number one enemy in our research because they eat on our plates. Uh, you would find this all over <laughs> Manila Bay at certain seasons. So the next time you go to Bay Walk, you can fi find them swimming there. If you want, you can go snorkeling there. Okay, uh, you would find them. So it's not really late. It's not endemic to Manila Bay, but it was first described from Manila Bay. That's why it's Manilensis. It's a nice fish. Okay, it's really, but it eats our, our instruments. <laughs> okay, so another one, and this is more of recent. Uh, remember that new sardine, uh, Sardinella Pacifica, uh, which was described earlier this year? Uh, by two Japanese uh, ichthyologists, uh, Hata and Motomura. This, the holotype, was actually collected from the South Harbor. Of all places, South Harbor discover a new species. Anyway, the Manila Bay Valley st statistics, okay, uh, 58 species from 31 families of fish according to fish bays, about 200 plus, plus species from 35 families of mollusks, 16 species according to the DNR from nine families of mangroves, perhaps uh, Dr. Dolan can update us on that. Marine non-indigenous species, 25 plus plus in increasing, 
Uh, are there many examples? We don't know. That's why it's a challenge. Uh, if you want, you can have your thesis uh, work on Manila Bay. And do your PhD dissertation on Manila Bay. And most likely, all of these uh, numbers are underestimates. Anyway, uh, if you look at my in 2012, uh, the Biodiversity Management Bureau, it was known, known as PAUD then, had a uh, training on on a rapid ecological assessment of uh, Manila Bay Biodiversity from several sites, Tortugas, in the Pampanga River Delta, Sasmuan, I think Melody was part of this, <laughs> yeah, and Navotas, Napapache, Navaleta, Naik, and Ternate, and all the problems are dealing with so he waste, the major ecological problem, and the, ha and the habitats are mainly mud flats, sand flats, and mangroves, and some beaches. Okay, so uh, um, ecological analysis would suggest that the highest biodiversity is actually around the Lapapachaya area. And this is not the place where they want to reclaim. So the highest biodiversity in the near shore area is recorded in the Port Anchorages, especially near Lapapachaya, um, which have been reclaimed or planned to be reclaimed. To think about it. Now, how come this is so? Manila Bay is historically part of the center of center of marine biodiversity based on my PhD research. Now we call it the Verde Island Passage, but if you look at all the museum material, the georeference material, uh, you would find that the Manila Bay is part of that. So it's not just where the island, we, put where the, we have to correct it where the island and Manila Bay, center of the center of marine biodiversity in the world. See, the more red you are, the more diversity there is. Okay, of course the country has other centers of biodiversity, but uh, especially in this area where we just came from yesterday, it's relatively un underserved, but it's historically, according to the museum records, it is the another center of biodiversity. And this is the picture that caught the attention of media. <laughs> the sunsets, they look the same, but if you look at the, the environmental context changes. Okay, this, this one came from the first two special in Manila. Hmm? 2009 photo is my picture, <laughs> and the 2019 photo is my picture. It's it's beautiful, but the environmental context of the Manila Bay has changed since 1910. And mud flats remain as the major habitat that need to be protected, and that also, uh, along with that, include the mangroves. Because mud flats can store a lot of carbon dioxide and nutrients, and they are a nursery for species, and they protect the coastline. And Manila Bay is not dead. The people are still fishing in it. Uh, this is my latest photo from Sisiman. Okay? They catch all sorts of sap sap okay? in uh, or slip mouth in English. <laughs> uh, and, and there's the somebody fishing with a butterfly net in in Maik. Okay? So it's uh, it's not dead really. So how much of the benefits that we can get from mud flat or sand flat? We haven't done a study on the bay, but uh, our colleagues from UPV have done, see Bell Campus, about 300 US dollars to 1,000 US dollars per year, per hectare. Or, uh, the one we did in the hall is 300 to 400 US dollars per hectare per year. Okay. And cleaners collect an average of four hours a day. And this income is enough to raise a uh, family's income, especially the poverty-stricken families on the coast, out of extreme poverty as defined by the United Nations. So if you reclaim, then you take that uh, income-generating potential from people in the coastline who are really uh, suffering from uh, extreme poverty. And then the picture I took in Iloilo. Perhaps uh, what Manila Bay, we can do Manila Bay is what they did in Iloilo. They started replanting mangroves in the right places. Uh, so this is along the esplanade. This is in Iloilo. Again, there's a problem of anywhere in the world, plastic trash. <laughs> That's a thing that we need to look into. And so I took this photo of a cruise ship leaving uh, Manila Bay. So 
the cheap loves Manila and perhaps we should love Manila too because that's the uh, Manila being a scene and in in all the in almost all of the important events in our history. Manila Bay. So with that, uh, we thank you for giving the opportunity to give you a quick rundown on my biodiversity. Thank you very much, Dr. Benjamin Vallejo. Another professor from IESM will give us general information on the state of nationwide efforts to conserve our coastal ecosystems. His research interests include aquatic ecosystems, coastal marine, biology and ecology, mangrove and seagrass ecology, coastal resources management, environmental impact assessment, and environmental sciences. He has been involved in several research projects such as Coral Reef Visualization and Assessment or CORVA, Blue Carbon Project Blue Cares of UP JICA, National Assessment of Coral Reef Ecosystems, and ICRMP for Masinloc in Zambales and Santa Ana in Cagayan. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Dr. René Enrolion. Arrow down. Arrow down. Arrow down. Arrow down. Because the previous speakers actually already talked a lot about Manila Bay, I may have to skip a lot of slides. <laughs> but uh, maybe I should not miss the title. There's Battle, which is uh, mentioned by BB <laughs> already. Uh, yung gera, parang natatapos, no? Pero ecologically, mukhang ang Manila Bay ay hindi natatapos. Actually, perpetual battle. Mamaya, i i <laughs> ecologically, no? So, um, and then, of course, my personal bias is uh, seagrasses and mangroves. That's why we started looking at Manila Bay. Mangroves lang muna. Pero actually, it actually... <laughs> a real mesocosm of what's happening in the, in the rest of the country. So, so I skip ito. <laughs> Another skip, pero before I skip, um, ang gusto lang sabihin ng slide na to is that a constant reminder na ang Manila Bay is not just Rojas Bolivar. Karamihan ng nasa media coverage, etc. Nagbabakho, nag, nag, nagki-clean up ay Rojas Boulevard. Ang Manila Bay ay 200 kilometers. Ang Rojas Boulevard ay isang one, one and a half kilometers lang yan. So it's a very small area of the entire bay, no? And then there's a lot of uh, uh, provinces going on um, involved. So hindi lang siya Metro Manila, hindi lang Manila, hindi lang Pasay. At, no? So um, and then ito siguro Malaki nga ang historical importance, malaki ang kanyang importance sa commerce and trade, and fishing ground as was shown by, by the previous uh, speakers. So, hindi na rin yan. <laughs> Pero nasaan ba ang coastal ecosystem? Kung sabihin natin na buhay ang Manila Bay, nasaan ang coastal ecosystems ng Manila Bay? But before that, um, ito yung parang typical, no? Na siguro you have seen many times this slide. Pero pinapakita lang na you have the, the coastline with the settlements and then you have the mangroves usually in the coastline and then meron kang uh, seagrass, seagrass beds, seaweeds and then you have the coral reefs and then the favorite um, area where you want to snorkel is the s itong crest and slope where you have the, so nobody wants to, s to, to study mangroves and, and seagrasses because you have better alternative corals, no? Do we expect corals in Manila Bay? Kasi, no? Kung ganyan siya, and of course, we, there's a lot of story about interconnectivity. That's why mangroves are important because meron kang nurseries, spawning and feeding function of especially that. Kasi hindi ka pwedeng doon mag-harvest mag ng tuna sa mangroves and seagrass beds. Pero there are areas where no, you, you have nursery and feeding and spawning grounds as a support to the to the open sea, no? Um, ang yung relation na yan, yung interconnectivity na yan, actually depends a lot on the 
uh, relative distance of these mangroves, seagrasses, and corals, and depends a lot on your coastal morphology. So if you have a very open area, pwede silang, well, 50 meters apart, but if you have a semi-enclosed area, your corals can be very, <coughs> can be at a far distance, especially if you have river input. So corals don't like fresh water, so. No, and then if you have a almost enclosed area, like Manila Bay, na ganito, you don't expect corals inside. No, pero, pero, these relations, ito, becomes a, a very big, huge uh, system. And then you have the mangroves, seagrasses, and, and, and corals outside. So ito yung Manila Bay. Oops. No, ay yung, yun yung uh, articulation nung, nung uh, relation na yun. So ito yung Manila Bay. So you, you, you should not expect a lot of corals, but they are part of the system, di ba? Yung, yung slide ni Sir Kanina, actually showed a lot of corals dito banda, dito banda, but not inside, of course, no? So, ayan, and then, teka, kasi nandito yung kodigo. <laughs> um, and then, this is La Papachea. Kasi, um, we started look, looking at nasaan ang mga coastal habitats. So, coastal habitats, we speak of mangroves, grasses, corals. So, we looked at mangroves. So, this is La Papachea, and then if you, for example, make polygons of the La Papachea, ito yan. La Papachea is Las Piñas, Paranaque, uh, ano, Critical Habitat Enhancement Area. No? It's a protected area. Madami. Ito, hindi na to La Papachea. Bakor na yan. Ito rin, Coastal Road na yan. Ito lang, no? Ilan yan? 15, about 15 hectares? Are there more? Di ba? Tingnan mo yung iba pa. So, Ayan, yun yung nasa northern, yung, kung ito yung, uh, ito yung, <coughs> Manila Bay, nandun siya sa tuktok, kung nasaan nagdi-discharge si Papanga River Basin. No? Nandun sila sa mga gilid-gilid ng rivers. So ito, hindi ito nakikita. Ito lang siguro mga, let's say, 10 hectares. And then a lot of uh, mangroves inside. Um, kung titingnan mo yan, Ganyan siya. So, a lot of mangroves here, pero patsi-patsi. No? Just patches. And then we, we started wondering, bakit siya patsi-patsi? Ba't, si, ba't hindi siya continuous? No? So, then we, we said, ilan yan? That's uh, 1,300 hectares based on 2015 image. And then we started, pwede ba nating tingnan yung dati pa? So, we started looking at maps, old maps. Salamat sa aking mga RAs. <laughs> and then, and then you see like, uh, ganyan siya. In fact, we, we came across the article 1944, I think 1847, dapat meron pang 44,000 hectares of mangroves in, 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 Metro Man in, in, in Manila Bay. And if you, i-shortcut na lang natin. So mahabang, mahabang exercise ng mapping, if you reconstruct everything, then mangrove should be like this. No? Ilan yan? That's actually 93,000 hectares. Ilan yung mangroves ngayon? Ng buong Pilipinas, 300,000 hectares. That was almost one-third of the entire mangrove coverage in the, in the country. Nasaan siya? Andun sa taas. So actually, if you, if you realize, this is Manila Bay, Hindi ko na binanggit kanina, but Manila Bay is 200,000 hectares. If you have 93,000 hectares of mangroves, parang one is to two. You have one mangrove, one part mangrove, two parts Manila Bay. Ilan na lang ngayon ang mangroves sa Manila Bay? 1,300. Ilan lang nawala? 92,000 hectares. So parang ano nangyari sa ratio? Kung meron kang ratio na red, red field ratio tayo sa, <laughs> sa nutrient. Itong kung ang ratio mo ay 1 is to 2, ngayon ay 1 is 2, ay, ay 1, no? Ganun na siya ka, kalaki. Um, and so, hindi siya, hindi lang to mapping exercise because we have the, the, the opportunity of the Picari project uh, looking at actually Pampanga River Basin. Itong ano na to, itong uh, line na to, this is actually 15 kilometers, 12 kilometers from the coastline, no? So, kung ito yung coastline, you go up, upstream to the, uh, uh, 
along the, the Pampanga River Main. That's 12 kilometers up to this. Anong meron? Anong meron dyan ay ganito. Ano yan siya? Yan ay bulaklak ng Soneracia casiolaris. Pagat-pat na mangrove siya. So, balik natin. Dito, maraming pagat-pat. That's Masantol, Pampanga. And actually, the very, very interesting about it is the locals there, they don't know that that's mangroves. Kasi panghalo nila sa Sinigang. Yes, yes, yes. Ito panghalo nila sa Sinigang? When I, when I, when I said, that's mangroves. No, sir, hindi yan mangrove. Kahoy ng, ano yan, ilog. Uh, mangrove yan. Kasi, <laughs> this is an Arasha Casularis with the, with the fruit and the, and the flower. And then Numatophore. Ang Numatophore, 1.4. Ah, hindi ko na babanggitin na yung iba kong RA sa walang 1.4. Lampas doon sa Numato 4. <laughs> no? So, that's, that's 12 kilometers from the, from the shoreline going there. So, it, that must then be very extensive, di ba? So, ganyan siya dapat. Ang daming remnant mangrove patches na prevalent doon sa area. That's, that's Sonar, Sonarasha Casulari. So, hindi lang yan. Kung titingnan natin ngayon, no, the, during the presentation of uh, Maia in Pams, itong si, si Dr. Soria was also very excited and actually approached me some two weeks ago and she said, you know, the presentation of Maia, I was very interested because uh, my MS thesis in 2009, which I actually established, she established the you know, the Paleo shoreline. Shoreline known. So, ito siya, 1,500 Ito siya, ito siya. Eh, di ba? Ang, ang baba, ang, ang, ang pasok lahat, yung mangrove area, doon sa Paleo shoreline. Actually, if you are not influenced by the intertidal, no, the tidal fluctuation, hindi mabubuhay ang mangroves. Dapat may salinity. And we, we, also have, we also have evidence that from here to here, up to 15 kilometers, it's still influenced by salinity. Mali yung sabi kanina na ibibenta yung fish pond to the government? Hindi. Dapat ang fish pond ay FLA. So it's lease agreement. Di ba? Hindi siya, in, wala, dapat siyang titulo. And, and non-alienable, lahat ng for sure. So kung ito ay for sure pa, dapat non-alienable yan. Of course, that's not, that's not simple as that. No? May, may mga titulo yung iba. And actually, ang silver tides may titulo yata. Pero, Sige, pero, pero yan. <laughs> pero kung ganyan siya. And then, look, ito yung circulation ng Manila Bay, di ba? So kung ito sana si, si uh, 93,000, of course, ideal. Ito sana si 93,000 hectares and you have a circulation like this. Buhay nga ang, ang, ang Manila Bay. Di ba? Kung ikaw si, ikaw si Dolphin, um, following your prey, Baka kaya ka na strand dito, strand, quote and quote, kasi nagpa-follow ka ng prey papunta dun. No? Following the... Baka ganun yung ating pagtingin. And then, dahil nga, we, we were looking at the uh, Pampanga River Basin, ito yung catchment area ng Pampanga River Basin. Gano'ng ka gano kalaki yan? That's 2 million hectares. Ito? That's two. Can you imagine the amount of water going out here? That's half of the entire entire system, yung nandito at saka yung nandito galing, ito is actually half. No, half meaning 6 billion cubic meters of water going out here every year. Kaya dapat ang dami mangroves actually. Because a very rich, no, coastal eastern area. Supposedly. Pero ano nangyari? So ganyan siya, 2 million hectares and um, Ah, na banggit ko yun. So dapat ang 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 laki ng kanyang nagagawa, yung extent pa lang ng mangroves. And see if you have this nice system para siyang textbook actually. Yes. Para siyang textbook going from from there through this tapos meron kang uh, circulation. You have a very nice system going uh ito. Ano to? This is storm surge. So kung meron kang Mangrove sana dyan, and then meron kang storm surge doon. Ito yun, ang ganda sana ng natural bioprotection ni mangroves, di ba? 
dito halos wala, dito halos wala, may konti. Ito, of course, Manila wala na siguro tayo magagawa dyan. Because if you look at population, it's also like this. So this is, this is uh, the, well, the, 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 the darker, the denser. So kung i-decongest natin Metro Manila, punta natin doon, imbis na gusto nating pag-isipan na i-bawiin yung ilang mangroves, <laughs> Wala na, kasi tatakpan din natin. Pero nilalagay natin sila sa harm's way, actually. Papunta doon sa, sa storm surge, no? Um, so kung ganyan, kung ganito ang mangroves dati, nasaan yung mangroves ngayon? Nandyan pa rin. <laughs> Tingnan nyo. Yung mga green na maliliit, yun na lang yun siya. Dati siya yung ganito. Tapos, ganito. Ano nangyari? Mostly, ginawang fish ponds. And if you if you go if you go to this area, it's it, it's fish pond everywhere nga. So kung at ito yung kung magre-reconstruct tayo, and we, we were doing this, we had this this map, this map, and this map. Actually, we 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 said it should be this much, and then in in 1840, 54,000 hectares na lang, and then today it's almost less than 1,000. So kung ganon tayo. So there's a huge loss. No, la ko. And then uh, there's uh, the yung present distribution reflecting a very, I don't know, huge loss, no? Um, na halos wala na siyang, huy, paano to? Hmm? Ayo. Halos wala na siyang 1% of the original uh, distribution. Um, kung ganyan sana, saan ba sana tayo dapat pupunta? No? Um, shall we go towards restoration like this? Pero hindi naman siguro. Baka imposible na yan. I was thinking maybe only 10% can be <laughs> can be reasonable. Pero if you talk of 15 uh, 10%, 9,000 pa rin dapat yan. No? So, tayo masaya. Merong 1 hectare, 2 hectares na, na, na planting of mangroves. Pero 2 hectares for this system is nothing. Kahit bigyan mo po ko ng 10 hectares, even Lapapatsaya. Lapapatsaya is only 15, 15 hectares. Ang kailangan mo ay 9,000 uh, 9, 9, hectares. No? Um, so, kung ganyan sana, ito yung, parang, baka ito yung restoration. Ano bang nire-restore mo kasi? Di ba? Ibabalik mo siya sa dati, but maybe that's impossible. Baka enhancement na lang, or baka rehabilitation na lang. Pero hindi siya, bang hindi na to, impossible na to. Um, still, di ba, ang ganda sana ng kanyang sistema. Pero, ganito, na sana, ganito siya ngayon, business as usual, tapos nag-iisip pa tayo ng ganito. Ah, hindi. Hindi pa. <laughs> Even with the business as usual, marami pa rin ganito. May stranding ka ng 500 dolphins in Bataan in 2009, meron kang 2018 na meron pa rin dolphins, no? sa loob ng Manila Bay, meron ka pa rin itong, itong mga reports na to. So actually, buhay na buhay nga yung Manila Bay. So, sana, kung ako man yun, dito, ang battle ko baka dito. No? So, yun ang dapat pag-isipan ng malaki, at least para sa akin, kasi ang implication na hindi lang <coughs> restoring mangroves for the sake of restoration, it's actually the entire system. No? Um, and then, Kita mo daw, meron ganito, di ba? Ano yan? So, imbis na mag-isip ka ng restoration somewhere here, then you say, this is actually this. Ito yun eh. Ina Inaun ko lang. Um, <coughs> Pinapoligon ko lang ng RA ko. So, ito yung uh, actually... <laughs> ito yung master plan na 2012 pa nga po, actually, di ba? May, may, may clearance from the cluster committee. Um, so, kung ganyan, parang, ang tawag yan? Dahil ako ay mangrove, immoral para sa mangrove. <laughs> um, so, sana ganyan. Pero even with this, na i-restore mo, tapos magre-reclaim ka pa rin, nakakatawa yung mangroves mo. Kasi yung mangroves, wala na function. No? So, even if you go full restoration, but still go ahead with this, wala pa rin. Ano ang function ng mangrove mo? Nursery, spawning, feeding. 
paano magpo-function siya as nursery spawning feeding kung ganyan tayo. So siguro nga ito yung dapat pag-isipan ng mas matindi-tindi. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's 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 full note reclamation but th this should be uh, this should be reviewed more carefully and 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 reflected on more seriously if we have to go to let's say restoration yeah no in conclusion ito yung nabanggit ko na to um and maybe there's a ano to yung pressure continue today siguro may need tayo ng ganito uh, environmental battle plan nga yeah. Uh, kung siguro may development talaga but if there should be development dapat we should decide the non-negotiables saan ba yung non-negotiables na yun and then yung non-negotiables kailangan siya specially explicit hindi siya tipong ay ganito ganitong index ganyan ng index i think it should be it should be uh, specially explicit and actually more scientists should be or and, and practitioners should be looking at uh, broader uh, broader perspectives Um, I went quickly through this. Tiningnan ko yung uh, publication on Manila Bay. Parang 4% lang. LCBL lang to. For the for the past uh, 1970 ilang taon yan? 50? For the past 50 years. For the past 50 years, 4% lang ang merong publication on Manila Bay. Pero kung titingnan mo yung top 49 of the one that one <laughs> of the top 100 universities ay actually nasa vicinity ng Manila Bay. So we are looking the other the other direction. Hindi natin tinitingnan, no? Hindi natin masyadong tinitingnan yung uh, backyard natin. Inaaral natin yung malayo, pero actually, I, well, mangroves, I'm also guilty. <laughs> um, kahit kung saan-saan na nakakarating, pero wala pang tutok talaga on how mangroves in, in Metro Manila should be should be Uh, managed. Um, ayun, so may ganyang need siguro nga. And then ang, ang sabi ko nga, ito talaga siya ay hindi lang siya Manila. You look at Cebu, na nireclaim din yung Cordoba. You look at Davao, hindi ganun din. So maybe baka let us at least conserve these remnant ecosystems. Re remnant sila, natitira sila na tingi-tingi, but at least uh, conserve them now and then let's later maybe let's 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 think of rehabilitation if not full restoration but maybe full restoration is impossible pero yun nga siguro that's th I, i of course that's an uphill challenge for a metro very big me metropolis like manila bay uh, Ma manila <laughs> metro manila which has to de decongest but uh ayun i think that's my sli last slide and thank you very much Thank you very much, Dr. Walion. <laughs> Our next speaker is a graduate of BS Biology from UP Manila and has earned her master's degree in environmental science from UPD IESM. She has been a member of the faculty of the UP Manila Department of Biology since 2002. She also serves as the College of Arts and Sciences Coordinator for Alumni Affairs since 2016, and she teaches vertebrate morpho Physiology, physiology, ecology, parasitology, invertebrate zoology, and science 11 classes. She has been working on ecological studies with a group formed by Dr. Benjamin Vallejo Jr. and is a member of a rowing team that trained in Manila Bay. Everyone, here is Professor Melody Ann B. Ocampo. Okay, good morning. So, um, I've been working with uh, Dr. Valdeo since uh, 2009 uh, about uh, Manila Bay Ecological Studies. And uh, my interest in this is actually personal because uh, I've been in Manila all my life. So, I was born in a province and uh, uh, after two months, uh, I was uh, brought to Manila by my parents. So, Manila Bay is, uh, was part of uh, my childhood. Um, going there and the seeing the sunset and uh, this and in 2005 I became part of a rowing team team which trained in Manila Bay so I am a 
rush guard na ito yung <laughs> and then <laughs> but this was taken in China when we represented the Philippines in a rowing competition and uh, that's the the uh, trophy that we got because we won third place. Ako ulit yung naka-rush guard na ito yung naka-luhod, pangalawa. <laughs> Kasi ayaw kong umitin. Kaya. So, when I heard that there was a, a call for people who would like to uh, work on Manila Bay, I, uh, I joined in uh, happily. So, Doc Ben started in 2006-2007 and I joined in 2008 or 2009. And uh, it was part of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission for the Western Pacific Program, which looked into uh, marine invasive species and how to manage marine invasive species. And also as a um, uh, compliance also to the International Maritime Organization standards to look into marine invasive species. And of course, Manila Bay uh, was a uh, area of interest, an area of interest mainly because of the following uh, reasons. So Manila Bay is surrounded by a highly urbanized and rapidly urbanizing community, has many environmental issues such as land and sea, base pollution, sedimentation, reclamation. More importantly, Manila Bay is the location of the port of Manila. Now, the Philippines' biggest port consisted of the north and south harbors, and areas near the port are used for mariculture and fisheries. And um, as such, uh, risk of marine non-indigenous species biological invasion is high. So we decided, or Doc Ben decided, to look into Manila Bay. Um, for the study of marine invasive species, uh, there was a uh, need for a collector that can be used in uh, Southeast Asia so that uh, the studies can be compared, uh, so that we can have a um, more united um, uh, results no, in, in terms of analyzing what we see in uh, the Southeast Asia in terms of uh, marine invasive species. So there was a need for a development of collectors for sampling and monitoring is marine non-indigenous species no, in port areas. And uh, the PISES, North Pacific Marine Science Organization Collector, was uh, modified so that it can be used in Asian tropical waters. So we looked at the fouling community of Manila Bay, which uh, of course would uh, show us if there are non-indigenous species and uh, if these non-indigenous species are potentially invasive. So we looked at the fowlers, now we looked at the uh, organisms that can attach and settle to any surface that could come into contact with water. So these are just parts of uh, um, some structures in Manila Bay when we can see fouling organisms. And we look at biofouling, so this is what happens when you put any surface in the water, in marine waters, so you have the conditioning of the surface, followed by bacterial colonization, followed by colonization of uh, unicellular eukaryotes, and then you will have the multicellular eukaryotes. So this can happen in a span of uh, five days to seven days, and you can have the uh, four steps now already present in the following uh, on the surface now that you put into the water. So we looked at the Manila Bay Harbor, although again it has been extensive, we uh, also put collectors in um, the Sandley Point, the uh, port there, and uh, this is the collector that was modified, which we used, and it's very economical. So we, we used a bucket lid, yung mga takip ng balde, na para Kasi kahit saan dapat sa Southeast Asia, pwede siyang gamitin. Tapos hindi masakit kapag kakinain ng isda. Kasi <laughs> nangyayari sa amin all the time. Well, when uh, there are um, storms, no, we lose some of our collectors. So pag masyadong mahal yung collector namin, syempre medyo aray. So you have the, we use the bucket lids where we attach uh, petri dishes, mga plastic na petri dishes. Ayun po yung mga apat na, apat na plastic petri dishes on each uh, bucket lid, and then we attach the line you know, in between, uh, sorry, uh, in the middle of the uh, bucket lid, and then there's a weight uh, na naka-attach din para pagka uh, ibinaba namin sa tubig, uh, hindi naman siya masyadong gagalaw. So you have cement weights, now we attach cement weights to uh, make sure that uh, uh, they don't go anywhere now with the tide or with the waters. 
So we put this fallow collectors at our sampling points in the uh, different sampling areas along Manila Bay, uh, especially along uh, the harbor, no? Manila Bay Harbor. So ito yung tsura niya bago namin i-deploy. And uh, we, after deployment, we have uh, uh, around a month, no, every month, we retrieve the sampler or the collector, and then we take two petri dishes, and then we examine what are the organisms in the petri dishes we identify. And then we bring back the other two, those uh, original young lugar, so we deploy again. The two that we do not get, uh, we will get by the end of the year, so that we can observe succession. No? So this is how uh, the bucket lids, the collectors look like after they have been submerged for uh, two months or so. So napaka dami pa nang naka-attach talaga. Kaya kailangan mag-gloves pag uh, inangat. No? Na, nakakasakit yung mga, uh, mga organisms. No? You have the polykits which are calicarious and they're all over. So kailangan medyo mag-ingat. That's how the petri dish looks like no? after retrieval. So you can see the different fouling organisms from the petri dishes. And then we identify the organisms present. Now we remove, we pic take pictures, we collect, we count, and we use uh, databases to identify the organisms. And then we have, of course, confirmation by experts. And then more recently, we barcode now the different organisms. Now, we have seen the succession in uh, the community that we have observed. Uh, first, we have the barnacles settling. So when we, this is when we talk about the macrofowlers, no, yung mga multicellular eukaryons that are settling on our collectors. You have barnacles settling first, followed by bryozoans. And then you have the tube worms, the polychaetes, the marine worms. And together, they make the biogenic matrix. So they pave the way for the other organisms to settle on the fowler, uh, on the collector. And then you have the different the species of bivalves, and then the algae, and then you have the nodarians. So these are the indigenous species that we have found in the collectors uh, through the years. So this is a list, but uh, to all together, plus the non-indigenous species we have uh, observed around organisms coming from 20 families. And um, syempre, ang mas mahalaga sa atin yung non-indigenous species, of course, when we talk about marine and bio-invasions, uh, because it is with this list that we can analyze no, which one is potentially invasive. <coughs> so we have found around 15 of these uh, species, non-indigenous species. And uh, these are what we expected to be invasive, especially uh, Mytelopsis salei and Mytelopsis adamsi. So these were the first that we detected as uh, potentially invasive, and we were following their counts. And uh, surprisingly, they weren't invasive. Their abundances were very low. But if you look at our neighboring countries, we look at Thailand, um, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, especially, they were invasive. No? They invaded the ports and the harbors, no? and they spent a lot of money just to eradicate, uh, if not mitigate, the, uh, these species. So uh, the big question was, why did they not invade Manila Bay? So how iba talaga, special talaga ang Manila Bay. So we found out that um, monsoon driven uh, periodic hypoxia and other pollution related events. Uh, could be accounted for, for their failure to invade, and also their interactions with other species. So that they cannot compete no, with the other species uh, that are thriving in Manila Bay. But we found one that is uh, potential, potentially invasive, or actually increasing in number. We have Maitela Charuana, first observed in 2014 in Manila Bay, first reported as Maitilus due to its similarities uh, to the species. So you have the shape, morphometric measurements, and valve color being similar. But eventually identified as Mytella through genetic analysis. 
and that paper by uh, Doc Ben uh, won him and the team an award um, when they uh, identified Maidela. Uh, Maitala is used for mariculture in the Lingayen Gulf, and uh, it's able to become invasive because it can compete with established species in Manila Bay, like Perna. So it recruits earlier than Perna and likely to persist in Manila Bay as an invasive species because it occupies or overlaps with the niche of Perna, no, with lower pH salinity and higher nitrate. Now this is how Maitala looks like. Uh, kinakain po siya yung minsan kumain kami ni Doc Ben sa buffet sa isang hotel nakita namin siya, nandun siya, nakakain siya <laughs> <laughs> kasi for mariculture naman talaga siya kaya siya anong dito sa Pilipinas, so nandun naman pero mas masarap pa rin yung tahong <laughs> kasi sa kanya <laughs> so it's um uh, a native of uh, South and Central America, specifically along the Pacific coast of Mexico to Ecuador and along the Atlantic coast of Colombia to Argentina. So, ganyan po siya kalayo sa atin. Dito siya nanggaling. And then, yan ang kanyang uh, native range. So, first appearance in Manila Bay and then in uh, Pangasinan and then in Dagupan and then in San Fabian, Pangasinan. But I, I saw Doc Ben's... Uh, uh, PowerPoint and uh, there are more recent reports coming in na uh, meron pa sa ibang parts ng Pilipinas, not just uh, in Pangasinan. <coughs> so, since we, we received reports that Maitela is not only observed in Manila Bay and in other parts of uh, the Philippines, so the team decided to look into these uh, different populations and uh, we compared no, the populations and we found out that uh, the populations in Manila, Nagupan, and Bulinao were genetically similar. And uh, they are linked to populations in Singapore, Panama, and Colombia. And that Maitela that is in Singapore probably came from the Philippines. So. And uh, that uh, there are two unique haplotypes found in the Gupan and Bulinao and mutation caused this due to uh, multiple invasions of Maitela in those areas. So for future studies, so of course we are continuing our uh, look into the uh, Manila Bay Harbor and there are numerous organisms yet to be identified and assessed. So there are many species which are of interest like that of uh, polychaetes, no? kasi ang dami talaga nila sa plates namin. Tunicates and sponge species. No, we've only looked at bivalves no, very much, very extensively because they're uh, economically important. No, malaking fowler na nga sila. Tos some of them can be part of the diet. So there's so much to study. No? And the, for example, in the polychaetes, uh, which we have uh, identified as invasive, simula pa lang, uh, family level pa lang yung karamihan na na-identify na namin. And uh, again, they, are, they can also be used as bioindicators of the state of the Manila Bay. So it's really important that we look into them more. And the uh, ecological parameters should be constantly monitored because they play a key role in the success of invasions. So I, uh, Doc Ben has shown you this, the recent pictures about uh, that shows our collectors and then the species of sponge that uh, we hope to identify because may lang namin yung nakita na very recently. And that's me in 2009. <laughs> Sobrang payat. And then you have the, when you were observing the different uh, species. And then, of course, there are more of us. And then our students who have joined the team. And pinakita ni Doc Ben. And then recently, we also have help coming from the Philippine Coast Guard. And mm -hmm. visit sa lab the Philippine Coast Guard. And then uh, our publication, uh, the results of the studies have uh, garnered uh, some awards in kay Doc Ben yung best uh, paper, second poster, sa amin poster. So sila nakaayo sila kasi announced yung sa akin hindi. <laughs> so, hindi ako sa dulo ng Manila Hotel, nakaupo sila pag gumagawa ng lecture, tapos bilang tinawag, okay, best poster. 
and then these are uh, of the, the other species of interest. So that one we will study uh, this year, the, the white um, bivalve, uh, because uh, of course we have to look in its potential because it's non-indigenous, so our students are now working on uh, this particular species. This is my tela, so you know, this is my tela. <coughs> okay. So thank you. Uh. Thank you very much, Professor Melody Ann Ocampo from UP Manila. The speaker who will give insights on Manila Bay watersheds is also an academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology and a professor at the National Institute of Geological Sciences of UP Diliman. He serves as director of the UP Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards, or UP NOAA, and executive director of the UP Resilience Institute, which is tasked to undertake research, disseminate research findings, establish non-degree educational programs, and improve the capability of UP as an agent of change in formulating and implementing advanced academic programs on disaster resilience in the Philippines. Everyone, a round of applause for Dr. Alfredo Mahar Francisco Lagmay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I'll be presenting the talk that was uh, given to Mayor Isko. No? Uh, I think that was last week or two weeks ago. And it's about an intelligent disaster risk and resilience management program for the city of Manila. I thought that uh, it would be better to present this as uh, a background on what UP can do for the city of Manila, no? including Manila Bay. Of course, it has the same name. Uh, it gets the name, name from the city of Manila, which is the capital. And whatever we can do there, hopefully, can be replica replicated uh, for all of the cities uh, in watersheds surrounding Manila Bay. Uh, later on, I will make a call for volunteers no? because ev everybody, and I think all of the talks that were given here, uh, is applicable in the work at hand. Oh. Somebody in computer. Where? There. Yeah, okay. Oh. Malay. Okay. So the, the presentation went like this. No? Um, first, we presented what UP was all about. We're a public service institution uh, based on RA 9500, or what we call as the uh, Act to Strengthen the University of the Philippines as the national university. And the purpose is that it is to lead as a public service university by providing various forms of community, public, and volunteer service, as well as scholars, scholarly and technical assistance. We also have this uh, mandate, uh, which is uh, present in the General Appropriations Act, which is actually a law, no? because it's part of the General Appropriations Act. And it states that the University of the Philippines Resilience Institute, together with other state universities and colleges, shall support the CCC in training LGUs to formulate and complete local climate change action plans and comprehensive land use and development plans. And the UP should empower LGUs with science-based information and technologies for development planning such as CVDRA or Climate and Vulnerability and Disaster Risk Assessment and multi-scenario probabilistic hazard maps. And the objective of the proposal was to strengthen the DRM system of Manila, system of Manila City through an integrated and harmonized risk assessment planning, organizational development and capacity building processes in order to save lives, reduce damage and losses, protect livelihoods and businesses, and ensure a healthful and balanced ecology for Malilenios. No? Uh, when we talk about Manila, I think we, we relate. No? Uh, UP especially because the origins of Manila, of the University of the Philippines, our first 
campus was in UP Manila, which makes us a stakeholder of the city of Manila. We're citizens of Manila. We tried to present the guiding principles of the program. It's supposed to be science-based with climate change project projections, the use of advanced but low-cost technologies. There must be participatory, uh, a participatory process with shared management and accountability with capacity building and transdisciplinary expertise. Uh, by transdisciplinary, we just don't talk about uh, meteorologists and geologists or scientists and engineers. We go farther than that. We need the people to embrace the science and technology. So we need psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, uh, social scientists, people from the humanities, from the arts. We want the musicians of UP to compose songs so that they can uh, so that the street children can sing songs to raise disaster awareness. In much the same way that uh, we can learn history of the Philippines from songs, like uh, the song of Yoyoy Villame. No? Do you know when the Philippines was discovered, sir? What year and what month? <laughs> sir, I'm asking you po. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you get to listen to the song of Yoyo Ibillame, no? uh, Magellan by Yoyo Ibillame, the Philippines was discovered in 1521, in the month of March. In March 1521, <laughs> Magellan discovered the Philippines. Okay, so we can teach in much the same way as we teach history to our young children disaster awareness through songs. So it's not only scientists and engineers that take part in solving the problem of Manila and our country. So we need to bring together all of the expertise of the University of the Philippines system and we have that perfect op opportunity. The door has been opened uh, for us to help Manila. No? And whatever we do in Manila, hopefully will get repeated elsewhere. No? Manila is the capital of the country. Aguinaldo failed to conquer it. Bonifacio failed to conquer it. Even Antonio Luna failed to conquer it. I'm not saying that we were able to conquer it, but we have a door that is open for us to help. And that does not include only scientists and engineers. It includes everybody. Whatever part that we can make in contributing to helping Manila, uh, I, I make that call for us to help. <coughs> Hi. Wrong button. OK. So the overall methodology was uh, this one. Uh, it's IoT-based. That's why. Uh, we're talking with UPLB guys, engineering guys, and especially the laboratory of uh, Dean Gani Tapang for uh, internet, uh, technol uh, internet of Things. Institutional analysis, enhanced climate and disaster risk assessment, land use development plan, disaster management system upgrading, contingency and evacuation planning, DRRM and climate change action planning, Capacity building, development of risk communication products, and we're supposed to do it in phases for a period of two years. Sir, we need you here. Uh, we're talking to Jan Pulhin, to a lot of people from the UPLB, a lot of people from SURP, uh, SERP, uh, NCPAG as well, and we need to uh, work together in trying to make the plans of uh, Manila very good. No? So it has to be well executed because whatever we do in Manila <laughs> will be seen by not just the country, people in the country, but in the world. And uh, in terms of phases, we want to do the CDR Atlas. We presented previous works, uh, adjusted hazard maps with climate change adjusted ha hazard maps, SIDRA enhanced loop. Uh, enhanced club and uh, 
the comprehensive development plans, the uh, training needs assessment, CPs, and emergency operation center. According to Mayor Isko, their last land use plan was made in 2002. And that was a long time ago. No? So 2002, it's uh, 70 years ago. So most likely it's outdated. And he showed me the assessment of DILG. And the assessment was in matrix form. And all I saw were red checks. No? Red. Or red X marks. No? <laughs> Talagang kawawa sila. No? Kawawa sila. Um, we also presented the DSS, LDR RMP, Emergency Simulation Tabletop Exercises. We have this Emergio, sim Emergio Simulation Exercise with UP Manila for uh, emergency uh, incidents and trauma care, uh, as well as the development of knowledge products and a risk communication plan. Ma'am, importante po ang uh, office nyo. All right. Um, and then in year one, so this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, year one, year two, and year, year two. Year one and two and year two. So major type, but I think uh, there's really a need. So that's why we have to compress the time. No? Uh, because we don't want uh, the disasters to get ahead of our efforts. And that's why we, we packed it into a two-year plan. We have a timeline which was created based on the UP Resilience Institute experience. We have a lot of experience in doing uh, local climate change action plans, comprehensive land use development plans, and some of them are listed here, including those that we did for Batangas in Taisan, Science City of Munoz. Uh, I think in Cebu, there were 51 uh, uh, LGUs that benefited uh, from the work of UP faculty, uh, Sidra, My High Laguna, etc., etc. So this is just a a uh, brief profile of what we have done. There's many, many more that we don't know. Even Dr. Cruz alone's work is uh, pro would probably be greater than this, no? And Doc Dean Mario's work would probably be more than this. So we have a lot of experience in doing this. Uh, we will work together and we'll try to execute it. The MOA is still being executed, no? Parang, uh, being drafted. But uh, technically, uh, uh, basically, Mayor Isko already gave his yes, no? On the spot while we were presenting this. So even before we finished, the moment that he saw uh, all of the list of experts of UP, he said, yes, let's take advantage of this. That's just 20 million that we proposed. And uh, it's really a small amount, but it's really a big door that has been opened for the UP community. So we presented flood maps. Uh, we tried to uh, tell him that um, we have the technologies uh, available. We have LiDAR technology. We have the drone technology to create the uh, detailed maps of um, Manila. And we also have... Um, Simulation expertise. Uh, even um, Felino Lansigan is a hydrologist. We have hydrologists from uh, engineering. We've been doing simulations uh, since a long time ago. And uh, we want to uh, actually relate the rainfall with the street floods that are happening in Manila. No? In the same way that uh, we can say that in our papa, okay, with a certain amount or intensity of rain, uh, a particular scenario would uh, correlate to that amount of rain. And the reason why our papa is always flooding is because it transects a creek that during thunderstorms overflow and flood the street in our papa. So at 60 millimeters of rain and 70 millimeters of rain, that is the depth of the water flood or the street floods that will happen. Apart from having historical accounts of the floods, uh, we said that it's necessary to, to present other scenarios. We have to do probabilistic risk assessment because we have to go beyond 
the historical record. Why do we have to do that? Because when we interview, when we see interviews of victims of disasters, what's common among their accounts? Their account is also, is always like this. Hindi pa nangyari yan. First time kami nakakita ng ganitong baha. We've never experienced a flood like this. We were not expecting that. We're supposed to expect the unexpected. And to do that, you need probabilistic risk assessment. And the international community actually uh, recommends that we depict those scenarios that are bigger than what the community has experienced, especially with climate change. And we can actually uh, project that rainfall and convert them into maps to have a probabilistic risk assessment, multi-scenario assessment of floods in different areas. And we said that if we just rely on the historical record, for example, this is a map based on anecdotal accounts and expert opinion. This is a low landslide susceptible area, a moderate uh, flood susceptible area. Violet refers to a high flood susceptible area. This is the population and this is the low flood susceptibility area, which we asked also to people in the community. We said, uh, if you were to put an evacuation center, where, where will you put it? They say, ah, there, that's the best place because we never experienced floods there. But the moment you do that and check with probabilistic hazards assessment, scenarios bigger than what the community has experienced, we see that, ah, okay, that correlates with the accounts of the people. But if we have a bigger flood event, and a much bigger flood event, especially with climate change, you, you automatically see that they are in danger. That's the reason why we have to go beyond the historical record. We have to depict the future scenarios bigger than what the community has experienced. And that is really the meaning of what we are doing. We have to use probabilistic risk assessment, and luckily, some congressmen and some senators have tried to adopt that. They, they saw the reason behind why we need to do this, and it's written in the Department of Disaster Resilience Bill, which hopefully will get approved by this year. So if they get hit the moment that it happens, in that bigger flood, and there's a survivor, what will they say? What will the victim say? Sabihin nila, Ay, hindi namin inakala, inakala. Hindi naman nagbabaha dito. This is the first time we've seen this kind of flood. But we don't want that to happen after the fact. We want that to be incorporated in the plans of the community. And then we propose the Internet of Things. I'm sure you've heard the word IoT. No? Some say it as a... <laughs> I will not say it, but uh, I'm sure you've heard of it. No? Okay. And we, we rely on the experience that we had from 2012, trying to develop with DOST all of these sensors, 2,000 sensors that stream every 15 minutes. And we want to apply that with a more advanced technology, advanced technology of, uh, uh, that was done by Dean Gani Tapang, uh, with robust start topology, uh, sensors, passing, uh, real-time data visualization and put it, of course, this is not Manila, this is just a demonstration, and all of these sensors communicate with each other. And when they communicate with each other, they talk to each other, they relay or they relay that information through, also, through a machine as well, and get uh, Mayor Isco informed for Mayor Isco to make better decisions. No? Uh, we can make those sensors uh, not just for street floods, for rain gauges, tide gauges, accelerometers, pollution meters, and river water and water quality sensors, and so on and so forth. And we also want uh, technically to put that in all, uh, in all nodes, no? in these uh, targeted areas where we can put the sensors all over the watershed of uh, Metro Manila. And for Manila, we've already selected all of those sites at key points so that we can hold 
accountable the barangay captains if there's something wrong going on in that in their area so we can put them here so water level sensors as well as uh, water quality sensors or whatever you want to put in there because they communicate we just add and add and add and uh, if you do that we have to also do that for all of the watersheds that contribute to manila bay and that's really a very big network we start with manila we get them to copy it so that the whole of manila bay will be free from all of those pollutants uh, that contribute to the waters of Manila Bay. So that's, that's uh, basically the approach. Get Manila first, make a good model, and get others to copy them so that they will uh, do the best practices as well. And then, of course, it's participatory. It's, it's a shared effort. We'll bring all of them, not just UP, we'll bring all of the universities of Manila. There are a lot of universities in Manila. UST, FEU, lahat ng UAAP na natatalo sa UP, <laughs> sasama natin. No? We'll make friends with them so that they can put the sensors in their campus. No? Uh, we'll work together. And again, when you do the plans, no? when you do the LCCAP, the CLUP, we're actually making plans across all sectors, including agriculture, coastal, water, health, forestry, biodiversity, and we have a lot of experts in these fields. UPLB, agriculture, you might, want, you might say forestry uh, for UPLB, wala naman, hindi naman pwede. Agriculture, Manila, hindi naman. There's such a thing as urban gardens. No? We'll, we'll help them. Uh, the talks about the, the Manila Bay Coastal will try to input in the sectoral plans. Uh, health, UP Manila is there. The environment, IESM is here. There's a lot of faculty in IESM, energy, uh, engineering, education, tourism, infrastructure settlement, and mining. Of course, mining, no? Sa UP geology then. No? Wala namang mining sa, sa, sa Manila, but uh, maybe for other uh, watersheds or other communities, it can be applied. And we also said that for sustainability, uh, just last 30 seconds, sustainability, we have this online platform. They can have that uh, account. We try to depict the scenarios of floods, in overlay them with the plans of the community, and then get them uh, to produce a risk assessment online. So they input the values of population for a particular type of hazard, RCPs, and then input them per barangay, number of households, and it automatically gets the percentage and the account. And if you submit it, you have this record already. We, we have this system available, and it's uh, running in DICT servers. So that means that it can be scaled up uh, rather easily. And if we need the backup, we have the College of Science uh, Dean. Ano ba yung servers natin dyan? Malaki ba? Uh, capable of doing petabytes, no? petabytes to handle uh, uh, the, the information for the entire country. But we'll start with Manila because Manila is very, very important. So that's the price that they have to pay. It's a small amount uh, considering all of the work, the breadth of work. But if we need more money, probably we can solicit, no? Uh, a lot of UP faculty, a lot of UP alumni donate to the basketball teams of U the basketball team of UP. We'll get some of those uh, to help fund the activities. And uh, Dean Mamper, the VP Pernia, will be in charge of that. <laughs> Magaling magsolicit. So the key features of the proposal are state-of-the-art science, climate change sensitive, multiple harmonized outputs, deep pool of experts from UP, participatory and transdisciplinary, co-ownership and co-management, sustainability, and fully compliant. So I, I, I make a call for everybody. You, you don't have to be an expert in a particular field. Even just volunteering for the workshops uh, is a lot of help already. Thank you very much on behalf of Manila. I hope we work all together, not just for Manila, but for the entire country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahar Lagnay.
Our next speaker is a professor at the National Institute of Physics and is currently the Dean of the College of Science of the University of, Philippi of the Philippines, Diliman. He received his Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, and Doctor of Philosophy in Physics in the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He is the National Chairperson of Advocates of Science and Technology for the People or the Samahan ng Nagtataguyod ng Agham at Teknolohiya para sa Sambayanan and is also a columnist for Manila Times. He does research in instrumentation, optics, and computational physics. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Giovanni Tapang. Um, magandang umaga po. Actually, uh, I can shorten my presentation by showing this. This is a water quality sensor and uh, with chlorophyll A, dissolved oxygen, depth sensor, turbidity, ter uh, conductivity, uh, temperature, uh, all for low cost and wireless and IoT. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> but um, which we can use actually to monitor not only the Manila Bay, but the whole uh, coastal systems of our um, country. However, I still have another project. This is a project that was done for a project under uh, harmful algal blooms with Dr. Alet Iniguez as a program leader. So this one was one of the uh, prototypes that we have. However, well, ah. sorry. So the, the thing that you want to have is, of course, uh, when you want to monitor environmental conditions is that you want something that is robust, available. You can do very small uh, deployments. Uh, the typical problem was is that this these equipment costs a lot, um, and therefore you want to have cost effective instruments uh, that you're doing. Uh, I had a project. Uh, which one is the? I, um, so typically, what you do is to have sensors just like this. For uh, you have wires. And with wires, of course, you cannot deploy it um, in the middle of the ocean. You just ha you could have a very long wire, of course, but uh, that's uh, going to be a problem. I had a project with UP and the OSD. This is called Visor. We were developing uh, sensors for high school students, and therefore we were trying to uh, combine different sensors in a one small kit so that you can use it for high schools all over the Philippines. So we had these sensors, so we're thinking, okay, you can plug it in, but can we cut the cord actually and do it uh, wireless? And once you thought about that, you can actually make a lot of other things more than a science kit for high schools. You can do environmental sensors, you can do water quality sensors, you can do cameras. Uh, we're trying to deploy bird cameras here in, at least in th our college, uh, so that you can monitor environmental health all throughout. Um, the other thing that came in, of course, uh, during development, so Visor was done in 2012. The other thing that came in was low cost radio uh, transmitters. Uh, and this is an example of that. This can be bought from Lazada. <laughs> You cannot uh, liquidate it with your project, so uh, we have to order it correctly. Uh, the other thing is that because you have wireless, cheap uh, microcontrollers that are powerful enough to process images, to process continuously uh, sensor data, then you can have little computers effectively uh, deployed with, it, with your sensors and just reporting to you over the radio um, and therefore you can have now them talking to each other and then I can put another sensor over there that sensor need not be talking to the directly to this sensor it can pass the message through and that will open a lot and that's essentially a mesh sensor um, LoRa is a long-range uh, protocol and you can use this um, to talk to each other you can use this to um, connect 
your nodes to a central server and you can actually monitor it on your cloud. Um, hindi po ako marunong lumangoy. Eh. Ang problema ko kapag ano, kapag magmo-monitor ng tubig, kailangan hindi ako pwede pumunta doon. So at least yung sensor ko na lang ang lalangoy para sa akin to help monitor not just Manila Bay of course but other areas. And that's where the idea uh, came uh, came from and you can now pass the message so that your central server will be uh, you you just be doing it and monitoring it onshore or uh, on a ship at the minimum. But there's one other project uh, so this project was being done with uh, Alet in Igas. Um, and there's another project is to instead of putting them stationary can we actually command them to go around and so I am in year one already with this so essentially that's your sensor um, sorry some biologists I actually had to uh, call it catfish catfish hito and arids are really just there the, um, and the idea is to have a a you just put a motor on this make it move around you can command it there's a floating sensor that will allow it to be recharged uh, charge so that you can actually have it doing continuously for several months and then you have these sensors talking to your base station so you can now deploy your sensors all around your bay uh, this was the, our first uh, iteration of it um, and then your end user will just be monitoring whatever those sensors are uh, it's uh, still year one uh, we have to test this and connect this together um, the sensors are ready um, this, this is the only part that we still have to finish by the next few months so we have pH, we have conductivity, we have turbidity, we have temperature, there's a depth sensor. Now the yellow thing here is a chlorophyll sensor um, and you can actually do a lot of science with these sensors. So hindi ako biologist, physicist ako, uh, hindi talaga lang bio, bio ang usapan dito. You engineers, physicists, other um, fields can actually participate in trying to preserve uh, Manila Bay by exercising what you know to help our biologists uh, and environmental scientists to, to do their science. Uh, <coughs> as I said, hindi, hindi naman ako nag, uh, uh, biology was not sci only. Uh, but now I'm doing this kind of, um, these kinds of um, sensors to help others do their science work. So that's the whole idea to put have uh, to put out uh, IoT sensors that can talk to each other, that can pass the, these messages. These are low cost. How low? Um, ang isang CTD is uh, the expensive ones, millions of pesos. Uh, but this one will be in the tens of thousands pesos only. Mahal na siguro yung one hundred thousand pesos. Uh, nitong sensors na to. Nito. Um, and you can just imagine, if you have one million, instead of buying only one sensor, now you can have ten of these. Uh, you can now deploy it in a better uh, spatial coverage and therefore do monitoring uh, as well as um, other um, the other sensors you can put in there. It's not just for water. As Mahar said earlier, you can put uh, flood sensors, you can have um, weather sensors connected to each other. And if you have a very dense sensor network, there's so much more that we can understand than just by having point sensors around. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, ha I also have to make an excuse. Uh, we have an emergency um, college executive board meeting. So I will leave my RAs there to, to answer the questions with regard to this um, because there's an urgent uh, question on promotions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean Giovanni Tapang.
So we will make a change in the program. We will have the open forum after we get the responses from our representatives from government agencies. To give a response from the government, it is our pleasure to welcome Mr. Jacob F. Meimban Jr., the Deputy Executive Director of Manila Bay Coordinating Office of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. A round of applause for the representative of Mr. Jacob F. Meimban Jr. Hello. Yes, um, good morning everyone. In behalf of um, Director Mayim Ban, I am Crystal. Um, wait, no phone presentation. So I will be giving a um, quick overview of our um, office and then some of our accomplishments for the Manila Bay Rehab. So, um, we were mandated by the Supreme Court um, together with 13, 13 different government agencies to clean up, rehabilitate, and preserve Manila Bay and restore and maintain its waters to Class SB level, which is fit for skin diving, contact rec recreation, and swimming. So, these are the 13 mandamus agencies that were mandated. Um, DNR, Department of Local the Department of Interior and Local Government, Department of Education, Department of Health, Department of um, Agriculture, Department of Public Works and um, Highways, DBM, Philippine Coast Guard, Philippine Maritime Group, um, Philippine Ports Authority, Metropo Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, Metropolitan Waters and Sewer System, and Local Water Security Administration. So we invent uh, DNR. Um, we have our operational plan for the Manila Bay Coastal Strategy. So basically, this is our Bible. At the end, we send them for the um, rehabilitation. So our goal is to um, clean up and rehabilitate Manila Bay. And for us to do that, um, we came up with five thematic clusters. Um, these are the thematic clusters. Um, we have the habitat and resources management, informal settler families and legal structures, solid waste management, liquid waste management, and inter institutional arrangement, partnership, and governments. So, um, um, each thematic, thematic cluster has um, lead agencies. So this is the Battle for Manila Bay. For the Battle of Manila Bay, we have three phases. Which, um, phase one is the cleanup water quality improvement. Dito pumapasok um, yung pag-clean natin ng waters, yung pag-monitor natin ng water quality, kung pumapasok ba siya sa standards. And then phase two is the full rehabilitation and resettlement. Um, dito yung um, pag-relocate natin ng mga informal settlers along coastal. And then for phase 3 is the protection and sustainment. Um, uh, more on habitat siya. Sa ngayon is ang ginagawa ng department is uh, phase 1 and phase 2. And then after ma-relocate na na ISF, after ma-monitor na yung water quality and um, pasado na siya sa standards, then we'll go to phase 3. So, um, this is the Manila Bay area. We have our priority efforts, um, which is um, more on uh, Manila Bay Rock, Baseco, and Estero de Abad. Because um, yung mga areas na yun is yun yung fully congested, yun yung um, masyadong baksak sa um, fecal coliform, sa water quality natin. And then we have our secondary efforts, which is outside the NCR na. So, me personally, nung bata ko, ay, akala ko ang Manila Bay is yung nakikita lang natin sa Baywalk. But no, umaabot kami hanggang sa Nueva Ecija. So, kung ang nakikita nyo is yung sa Baywalk lang, which is parang sinasabi nila, dead na, wala ng pag-asa. That's not true. We have a lot to offer in Manila Bay. So, after ng Boracay, na naging successful siya, sinarange kami ni President Duterte na 
if nagawa niya ang buhay, why not Manila Bay? Lumabas tayo, lakihan natin yung challenge. Some say na, ah, wala nang problema, uh, nagsasalang tayo na oras ng pondo. But no. So, um, because of lack of political will, um, inutusan kami ni President Duterte to expedite the uh, Manila Bay program. So, um, lumabas yung administrative order number 16, um, dito sa AO16, nadagdagang kami ng agencies to help in rehabilitating Manila Bay. Um, we are working together with um, PRRC, Pasig River Rehabilitation Commission, um, together with our two concessionaires, the Manila Water and Manila, and LRDA, which is under Laguna Lake. So, um, quick overview. Um, clean up water quality we and um, monitor establishments kung compliant ba sila sa water qualities. Um, nagi, um, together with LRDA and EMB, we issue MOV, CDOs, and ex party to establishments na um, um, yung iba hindi connected and then yung iba directly charge sila. And then, we also have water quality marking, uh, water quality monitoring equipments all, all over Manila Bay area. So, we monitor river mouse and alpha stations. These are the stations in NCR. And then, in Region 3, for A, um, mostly, ng mga yan ay baksak siya. So, <laughs> yun ang monitor natin ngayon. And then we also monitor bathing beaches. There and there. Um, if you can um, see, sa 4A, may mga bathing beaches na pumasa. Like um, yung Villa Excellence, Antonio's Hideaway, Delaroy Beach. Medyo mas mababa sila compare sa iba. Kasi medyo malayo na siya dun sa mouth. And then for the solid waste management, together with MMDA, DPWH, um, and um, the LGUs, we monitor namin yung solid waste na pumupunta sa Manila Bay. As much as possible, um, pinapromote namin yung mga MRFs, and then if narinig nyo yung kay Cynthia Villar, she promotes um, plastic conversion, na yung plastic waste, um, ginagawa niya into chairs. So that's good. And then here, uh, efforts of MMDA. So, ang MMDA and DPWH, every day, sila naglilinis sa Baywalk and Baseco. So, ang DILG, ay meron silang weekly cleanup. Meron, meron sa mga random seeker na mag sila every week in compliance dun sa AO16 natin. And then for DPWH, so for the US settlement, um, nakikipag, um, partner kami dito with um, the um, Department of Human Settlements and Urban Deve uh, Development, yeah. And medyo tumutulang ang DNR in terms of relo um, relocating ISFs. So ang ginagawa dito is ina-assess mo na yung area, tinitignan kung ilan, and then may mga areas na pag-relocatean sila. Um, isa na doon ay yung um, sa tala. Here. So sa ngayon, uh, ito pa lang yung families na nare-relocate kasi mahamang proseso siya. Hindi siya ganun kasimple. Pero um, minu-work naman na natin para maklear na talaga yung area and ma-rehabilitate na siya ng tuloy. Kasi hanggat may um, Hanggat may informal settlers residing along coastal, along Esteros, mahirap siyang i-rehabilitate kasi continuous lang yung pagdome. So, kahit anong clean-up natin, kah minsan maki-clean-up kami yung mga residents na katingin lang. Maki-clean-up kami, may batang gumagawa ng something sa gilid. So, ang ano natin is parang behavioral change hindi natin magagawa ito kung parang wala lang, okay lang. Kailangan tumulong din tayo. And I would like to take this opportunity to encourage everyone to be part of the Battle for Manila Bay. So, ano magagawa ko? We, the, in the department, um, we conduct um, um, monthly cleanups 
minsan twice a month. If you're um, interested, you can message us through Facebook or you can call us in the department and we will be glad the um, we'll help you if you want to volunteer or you can just, you know, punta kayo sa Baywalk, pulot kayo ng konti, ano ba naman yung five minutes na maglinis kayo ng konti. Sobrang malaking um, tulog na yun sa amin. And we would like also to thank um, University of the Philippines in terms of helping us in um, studies for Manila Bay. And partner na po namin sila ng, for a long period of time na po. In terms of um, yung mga hydrology, and then yung ibang um, mga studies po na pinresent kanina. So, um, yun lang. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, our representative of Mr. Jacob F. Maimban from the DNR. Uh, to give us another response from the DNR Coastal and Marine Division, please welcome Mr. Cr Christian Vincent Satuna. Okay, so good morning po. I'm Christian Satuna uh, from the Coastal and Marine Division of the Biodiversity Management Bureau of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. So, um, very ironic and well, sak sabi nila sakto kasi ang apunido ko sa Tuna tapos sa uh, Coastal na ka nagtatrabaho. So, uh, <laughs> Ano, uh, I was born <laughs> to be in the coastal uh, and marine division. But I, but I am under the Manila Bay Rehabilitation Project. We are working with the Southwest Alliance, uh, I don't know, so it's uh, So, kami, sa coastal and marine, under uh, BMB, uh, we have a lot of projects and also in coordination with UP, so shows MSI, so monitoring ng mga species sa uh, Manila Bay. And I will just give you information na uh, kung anong magagawa ng uh, Manila Bay project under BMB and CMD. So, isa dito is, uh, yung kung aware kayo, that there are residing pelican species in the Manila Bay area. Uh, these are the olive uh, uh marine turtle. So, uh, ang nesting places nila, it is found in the Bataan area, uh, in Morong, and also in Cavite. Pero ang kanilang foraging area is surprisingly sa Manila Bay. So, dun sila kumakain, dun sila nagmunit, tapos after noon, lalabas sila sa bay. Uh, bago magkaroon ng ICC, kung nabalitaan nyo, uh, noong 20... September 20, may nakuha na pawikan sa Maseco area, Maseco Playa, uh, na strand siya sa net. So, after siya ma-rescue, dinala siya sa BNB para ma-check and nakita na mayroong crack yung carapace niya. Pero it was um, an old wound, pero uh, siya yung minamonitor hanggang hanggang ngayon. Also, na nag-clean up naman noong 21, may nakita na hatchling na pawikan sa may Malavon area, sa may Bantali River. So, uh, yung ganang existence ng ating mga species ng pawikan ng marine turtle sa Manila Bay, ibig sabihin is meron pa talagang hope uh, for uh, rehabilitation and restoration sa uh, Manila Bay. So, hindi lang kami sa coastal kasi since nga ang approach namin sa uh, CMD is ridge to reef, uh, pati uh, taas, for example, uh, we're going to travel to Bataan on the 26 and to help one of the farmers there kasi nags-establish sila ng isang pilot demonstration site. Actually, nag-establish na kami ng pilot demonstration site sa uh, Dinalupihan. And it will help in soil loss mitigation using the technology of DA, uh, BSWM. Uh, it's called the Sloping Agriculture Land Technology. So, tinutulungan namin yung mga farmers sa mga area na medyo degraded and susceptible to landslides in order to have uh, crops and uh, trees na pwede mag-mitigate ng soil loss. So, isa yung sa ginagawa ng coastal and marine. Also, gusto namin ma-promote na maging ito siyang BDFE. Ang BDFE is a biodiversity-friendly enterprise. So, para matulungan ng ating mga farmers, uh, yung mga na hindi inga kasi mawawala ang mga interest ng mga farmers natin na mag-farm na kasi walang bumibili o mahina ang kita. So, ang ginagawa ng uh, BMB, ng DNR, is to uh, uh, motivate them to uh, not only uh, not only uh, para sa sarili lang needs, 
pero para magkaroon din ng awareness and protection. So far, yung isa namin farmer, si Tatay Pastor, is uh, nakapag, ano na siya, nakapag uh, gather na siya ng mga crops niya from the last uh, visit namin. And mas mataas yung naging yield ng crops niya uh, compared to sa other mga kasamaan. So, ngayon may ingyan niya na yung mga ibang mga farmers doon. And we hope that it can be replicated to other areas in Bataan because uh, as we know, uh, Dinalupihan is a highly susceptible to flood and mataas ang level ng flooding sa Dinalupihan. Um, also, uh, Pagkatapos namin mag-monitor sa Bataan, we will go to Morong naman to visit uh, one of our partners, si uh, Kamanolo, EBS. Isa siyang pawikan po siya dati, uh, converted into a uh, pawikan uh, conservation, convert, uh, conservationist. So, isa siya, isa siya sa nag-manage ng pawikan conservation center sa Bataan. So, na-convert na siya ng uh, DNR para alagaan at protektahan ng mga pawikan. So, yung result nila is... Uh, doon meron hatchery doon, sila na rin ang magmamonitor. Tapos yung mga dati niyang kasamang poachers, kasama na naman na nagbabantay ng uh, places sa Morong. Tapos sila na yung kumukuha ng mga eggs para i-transfer sa hatcheries. Tapos para alagaan, na-monitor. Tapos mabilang na rin doon sinasan ito sa sendro ng DNR. And also update din po. Uh, nabanggit ni uh, kanina yung Abad's Old Picture area as one of our mangrove areas. Uh, pero we're happy to report na meron pa tayong isa, uh, which is the Tanza Marine Tree Park in Novotas. Uh, mas malaki siya, nasa 26 hectares siya ng uh, mangrove forest. Um, kaso lang, uh, may reclamation na nangyayari doon, so pinupush namin na ano siya, maging protected area. Uh, tapos nandun yung natitirang dalawa na nilad sa Manila. So merong nilad doon, dalawa na hala. <laughs> so ano sila, uh, nagtanong sila ng 100 na, namatay yung 98. So yan, meron pa naman dalawa. <laughs> so, yan, sana mabihas. Pero nung last na nag-monitor kami is nung March, uh, March 15 uh, to 16, and may nakita kami mga uh, species ng reticulated python. So may sawa, may bayawak, may mga migratory birds na nandun. Nag-conduct din kami ng macrobentic. Um, and medyo marami rin pelicates. So mataas ang ano. And yung nagrata sa fish pot is malapit lang dun. Pero uh, Tanza Marine Tree Park is a very vibrant area. Maraming magdinas dun. So uh, co-over yung area na yun pag pumunta ka. Pag naglakad ka sa loob ng mangrove forest, hindi ka makakaapak ng lupa. Mapakan mo, styrofoam, slippers, kanyan, puro mga plastic. So, pero naging venue siya ng ICC noong Saturday. Pero dahil nga maliit lang yung carrying capacity niya, uh, more than uh, 100 lang ang pwede. Tsaka, you have to travel by boat para makapunta doon sa part na yun. So, kung meron mga interested na magkawin ng thesis o magkawin ng studies doon sa area na yun, Pwede niyong konta ng DNR and CR para maka, magkaroon kayo ng access. It's a very good place to uh, do assessment. So kami nagkaroon kami ng assessment and shoreline uh, tracing. And ganyan, yeah, magkakaroon siya ng coastal erosion due to the reclamation project na ginagawa sa likod niya. Kaya may mga mangroves na namatay sa may left side. Yung dating 26 hectares, nasa 20 na lang. So kailangan natin, ano, kailangan natin bilisan. Ngayon siyang PA. Kasi nga yan, to coordinate with the local government. And um, yun, yun, yun po, so far yun ang mga ginagawa ng Ghost Island Marine Division under the Biodiversity Management Bureau. Uh, yun, uh, pero in support to the Battle for Manila Bay, the Tuluan Tenajeros, kami naman po, uh, we do set activities uh, in coordination with clean up. So, hindi lang paglilinis, kundi pati pagpunta sa mga communities para turuan yung mga bata, yung mga mamis, kung anong pwede nilang gawin para makatulong sa environment. So, uh, basically, in-enjoy namin sila na maging part ng rehabilitation ng Manila Bay. So, hindi lang kami pupunta para maglinis ng kalat nila. Pintuan namin sila is paano hindi babawasan yung pagkakalat and instilling yung behavioral change, pagkakaroon ng idea na, ah, yung environment pala kailangan ko protectan kasi doon pala ako nakatira. So, isa sa mga nakakatawang response ng 8-year-old is, kailangan kong alagaan ng environment para hindi ako magkasakit. So, alam mo niya na pag sura ang environment, makakasakit siya. Tapos, sabi niya, para sa mga susunod, 
kung paano mga kalaro, hindi rin sila magkakasakit. So, uh, kasi nagkakaroon kami ng pre and post assessment after, uh, during our step activities. And so far, yun naman po. And also pala din sa, kung sa problema sa ISF, dun sa Tanza Marine Tree Park, pati na mga nakatira doon, ang ginawa nila, na-relocate sa may nagwapas eh. Tapos sila na ngayon yung mga batay bakawan. Sila naman yung nagbabantay ng bakawan para hindi patuli ng mga ibang mga tao. So, yun po ang ginagawa ng DNR, ng ano yung coastal and marine, ng, ng, ng central office namin to help and uh, protect our environment. So, thank you po. Uh, have a good day. Thank you very much, Mr. Christian Vincent Satuna of the Coastal and Marine Division of DENR. After the lectures, lectures and sharing about the rehabilitation efforts for Manila Bay, we will now hold the open forum. Please raise your hand so that we could cue the inquiries properly. You may approach the microphone in the middle if you have any questions and clarifications. You may address any of the speakers or ask all of them to provide input. Please mention your name before posing your question. We are inviting Dr. Rex Victor Cruz, Dr. Benjamin Vallejo Jr., Dr. René Rollion, Professor Melody Ann Ocampo, Dean Giovanni Tapang, and Dr. Alfredo Maharlagmay or their representatives to take their seats in front. Thank you. helpful as well to the local government units, many of whom are the proponents of this really devastating reclamation project. So uh, Oshana is very willing to help. Um, ha we have a platform for that para matulungan din yung mga local government units na akala nila kayang pwedeng pwede sila magreclaim without doing the mandates of environmental protection, which is a devolved service. Yung second, so it's more of comment. Yung second is question sa ating DNR. Uh, I don't mean to put them on the defensive, pero humingi kami ng kopya ng environmental impact assessment uh, na ginawa for Eritropolis. Hindi kami binigyan ng DNR Region 3. And this is a public document, and this is not an exempt document sa FOI law. Uh, how can we form um, informed decisions kung hindi ang publiko binibigyan itong uh, kopya na ito, hindi lang ang environmental compliance certificate na alam natin wala namang laman at naka-attach talaga siya sa EIS. So, I know you're from BMB but maybe can you share with us ano yung ano ng DNR on this matter? Maraming salamat po. person <laughs> uh, and the documents uh si central ba hey ano ba kaya doon si region po ma'am no ang hinihingi kasi uh, for example po kami uh bumili kami ng data for 
uh, soil degradation sa BSWM. And ang ginawa nila, dahil kailangan daw is my letter pa din, na uh, addressing the director of BSWM. So, maybe um, uh, making a letter to the director of Region 3 para dun sa data. Gumawa na kami. Gumawa na po kayo, ma'am. No, okay, ang sinabi niya, exempt, exempt daw, hindi exempt niya ibibigay po. sa amin. Yeah. Uh, so, so um, data po ulit, ma'am? Well, yung EIS. EIS. Kasi nagbigay sila ng environmental <coughs> compliance certificate sa aerotides. So now, uh, uh, San Miguel is going full blast with their re press release na mm -hmm. mag-groundbreaking na for the airport. Alam naman natin na flood prone uh, yun. And, and also, uh, yeah. alam namin ang moratorium ng reclamation kasama yan sa action plan for yung sa Manila Bay coordinating office. So, bakit inaalaw yung reclamation dyan sa Bulacan? Reclamation. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Um, actually, ma'am, um, with regards of that issue, kami po sa DNR, nagulat din kami na na-push yung reclamation na yan sa Taliptik Bulacan ho yan, na yung yeah. airport. Yes. yes. Um, may dumating na lang po sa aming report na may mga mangroves na na, na people without us knowing, without any permission. Ang sabi po ng mga taga-Bulacan do, ang taga-area ay um, may parang private citizen na parang binabayaran. Hindi sinabi kung sino nagbabayad pero baka po involved siya din sa airport na siya daw po ang nagputol. Mayroon po sila ang parang sinasabing name pero hindi na in-enclose sa amin. So, dyan po kasi, pag, in, pag reclamation po kasi, ang involved po doon na um, government is yung END po, Environmental Management Bureau, under DNR. Kami po, um, parang um, support lang po kami, pero sila po mainly ang um, may hawak ng anything na about sa, um, sa reclamation. So, sino po Baka po regional office ng DNR ang napadalhan nyo. Maybe po mas better kung EMB. Humingi din kami sa head office. So, nilipat-lipat kami. Mm, ayun po, ma'am. So, so, hindi ko po masyadong masasagot yun kasi wala rin po kami ng document na yun. Okay. Ang ano ko lang, kasi hindi ko naman kami kasama sa uh, Manila Bay Coordinating Office. Ang ginagawa kasi ng EMB, which is part of DNR, can be declared as contemptuous kasi may existing ruling ang it's still uh, hindi pa final and executory kasi yung Manila Bay case kaya nga nag-create nitong body na to para to ensure protection conservation of Manila Bay and then here's an, an EMB the EMB allowing giving that clearance to the proponent so isn't this well, pwede itong ma-raise, no? Na it's, it's a contemptuous act. Kasi dinidify yung order ng Supreme Court. Hmm. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, yun po sa pagbigay pag, um, po ng ECC, ng EMB, um, hindi po namin masasagot in our end. Pero um, sa ngayon po, um, hinihintay po natin yung master plan from NEDA para po sa relocation. Ang alam ko po, makahold po ang mga relocation ngayon. Hindi po nag- um, ang reclamation, hindi po nag, um, parang wala po silang go signal. Nagpapasa lang po sila pero naka-on hold po sila ngayon dahil hinihintay po yun sa master plan. Okay, marami pa akong tanong pero I know marami pang gusto magtanong. Thank you very much. Thank you. A reminder to the people who would pose questions, kindly make your questions brief and concise and please approach the microphone. Thank you. Hello po, ako po si Warner, uh, uh, graduate student po dito sa UP. Uh, just a quick comment to the representative of uh, doc, uh, of the DNR sa um, Manila Pay Coordinating Office. No? Uh, I think uh, many of us share this opinion that uh, we should not uh, no, point the problem to the informal settlers when it comes to the trash that ends up in Manila Bay. Um, it's uh, in the government data, actually it's in the TILG uh, data that we, when we look at the uh, trash that uh, comes into the Manila Bay area, most of uh, this come from the uh, commercial establishments. And the uh, compliance actually is very low. So um, 
in 2017, there is just uh, less than 20% of all the commercial establishments in the Manila Bay area uh, comply with the uh, sanitary uh, rules na meron doon. And um, pagkitin naman sa uh, residential, mas malaki pa actually, 30% ng commercial uh, commercial uh, residential area ang nagko-comply. So, uh, siguro uh, this is an input to your office na when you plan and when you do your project, no, sana mas malaki yung pagtingin at hindi lamang doon. Kasi you're pointing out that um, the second phase of your project is resettlement. And may I ask your office, how um, how much of your project is what is delegated for with the resettlement? If I'm not mistaken, it's less than 10%. Is it right? It's less than 10%. So if you're pointing out that it's the ISF, that's the problem, then why are you uh, just delegating 10% of your um, budget for them? Thank you. Okay, but just to clarify things, um, hindi lang po ISF ang nag -ano ng solid waste. Um, mayroon po mga establishments, commercial establishments, and households po. So, isa lang po ang ISF doon. Pero hindi lang po sila yung sinisisi namin sa pagdumi ng bay. Yeah. Again, a reminder for those who would pose their questions, uh, please do not approach the mic too closely uh, for the purposes of our live stream. And kindly keep a considerable distance. Thank you. Um, siguro input lang doon sa question kanina about uh, to, re reclamation. I think yung nagre-review kasi din ako ng ECC application since 1998. So, dalawang dekada na. Um, sa aking limited knowledge, itong in ng silver tides, hindi siya reclamation. It's actually land development. With the assumption na meron silang TCTs lahat. I think, and siguro yun yung magandang tingnan din, kasi supposedly non-alienable siyan, but may TCT sila. So kung TCTs nga naman, kung ikaw sa DNR nag-apply, develop ko tong lupa ko. Baka wala ka masyado ngayong raso na hindi payagan kasi i-develop ko to. So the fact na nagpuputol ka ng mangroves, ba't lupa mo yan? E di ba pag mangroves non-alienable? Di ba? E and that's happening, hindi lang Manila Bay. Hindi lang yan doon sa Pampangaria, Bulacan area. Mas kaysa Cebu. Ang reclamation doon sa Mandawe, magre-reclaim sana. Ang daming nag-reclaim na merong titulo. Pero mga abogado, sabi nila, and, and the, the mayor during that time was uh, ab abogado din. Hindi. For sure yan eh. So kahit napatituluhan nila yan, hindi nila lupa yan. So uh, again, hindi sa simpleng ano eh, 10% gawin natin, hindi. Madami siyang, madami siyang ano dyan. Baka yung EIS dyan ay land development lang kasi. Not even reclamation. Lupa namin to eh. Oh, pero nagpuputol ka naman grove sa loob ng lupa mo. Paano nangyari yan? Paano man naging lupa mo yan? P pero mas malalim ba na ano yun? Na pero kung titingnan mo lang sa, sa science-based, hindi mo dapat lupa yan kasi mangroves yan. Non-alienable yan eh. Siguro yun, doon siguro yung difficulty. Mas madali siya. Kaya sa nilagay doon sa, sa, sa regional level, kasi kung hindi, kung reclamation talaga yan, that's 4,000 hectares. That's not regional level. That's central office yan eh. Kasi ang, ang regional at saka central, parang 50 hectares lang, 20, 20 hectares. May, may certain limit na dapat regional lang kung reclamation. Pero ang inapplyan hindi reclamation actually, land development. Yun, siguro yun yung magandang pag-isipan din para sa planning. Kung lahat yan ay may titulo, may problemang malaki. We have time for one more question from the audience. Uh, hello po, uh, ako po si Narod Eko, isa pong science worker dito sa UP. Uh, tanong ko po sa mga scientists po natin, uh, dalawang parte po, no? isa po ay sa bawat isa sa mga scientists natin at isa po dun sa ating representative from Manila Bay Coordinating Office. Uh, 
So, uh, mga sir, mga ma'am, uh, re regarding po sa, sa situation at sa Manila Bay, given what we know about Manila Bay, um, based on your science, uh, since na reclamation naman yun na napag-usapan, uh, do you think that there should be a total ban on reclamation on Manila Bay uh, based on what on your science? No ifs, no, no buts, uh, yun lang po. Uh, tapos dun po sa ating uh, taga-DNR, uh, since nabanggit nyo po yung behavioral change, actually more of comment to, baka po pwede rin behavioral change ng mga corporations at ng mga mayayaman. Uh, pwede nga huwag sila masyadong uh, gahaman uh, sa pagsira ng <laughs> ating environment at pagpollute ng Manila Bay. Baka doon po dapat yung tutukan natin. Behavioral change po nila. Imbis po yung mga informal settlers, yung mga, yung mga may hirap, na walang hindi naman kayang bumili ng sariling toilet. Di ba? Kung may tumatay doon na bata sa tabi ng, ng ilog, baka kasi wala silang sariling kubeta. So yun po. Maraming salamat po. Sure. <laughs> okay, uh, I think yung science information man, malinaw yun. But uh, kasi ako nagtuturo na SDS, so there's not yung isa pang angulo niyan eh. Uh, Titingnan dapat natin yung outcomes, okay? Uh, kasi talagang uh, kahit naman sa ibang lugar, uh, sa Korea or sa Tokyo, tulad yung nilipat yung Kimpo Airport, uh, International Airport sa Incheon, they had to reclaim, di ba? and also sa Kansai, no? Uh, titignan natin yung outcomes, both from developmental outcomes, as no as also the, the scientific uh, contribution to the yung sa outcomes na yun. Ngayon, uh, may prinsipyo sa, ano, sa post-normal science policy that total bans do not work. Okay? Uh, tinutuloy yun sa STS-1, sa so UPD-Liban, post-normal approaches to, to science and, and development, mga total ban, hindi yan nag-work. Panaling makakuha ng legal, uh, the legal loophole, ma ma maiwasan yung legislation to IRR, paano maipalusot yung mga yung makaiwas lang doon sa total ban. So, kailangan niyang pag-aralang mabuti. Kasi, for example, uh, sabi ni ng presidente ng NAST, uh, si Dr. Rod Asamsa, na, na sinabi niya doon sa uh, ACES conference kahap ng isang araw sa Tawi-Tawi, na ang PPA, kailangan niya ng additional space and kailangan i-reclaim in certain parts of Manila Bay, pero with particular particular ano ports authority to ha particular uh, engineering approaches to minimize the impact kasi development is not anti uh, excuse me, envi environmental management is not anti development i think we have to be clear about that ngayon uh, bakit kailangan ang PPA magreclaim kasi ka nag-expand yung ating economy <laughs> And you need to have a, a, a port, a port uh, services that can handle the increased shipping. Yeah, yeah. Pero, you know reclamation for the purpose of improving our port services. But what about reclamation just for for residential and commercial development? Ibang outcome yun. Because port services is important to the national economy. But to the real estate development, which sector of the economy is just being... Uh, promoted by that. So, EECP yun. Okay? So, ang sagot ko lang dito, dapat pinag-aaralan. Hindi pwedeng total ban. Okay? Uh, we have to balance our development uh, objectives and outcomes of the country with, with the environment and, and uh, with respect to our environmental goals and outcomes. Um, just to agree with Doc Ben, because it's ideal to have total ban, no? Kasi, syempre, it will conserve what we have, but we have to be practical dahil, you know, we, we are a progressive country, no? We are um, going towards progress, so may mga, may mga sacrifices towards what we, what we are, the direction that we are going to, so... Uh, Yet we have to study, we have to make sure that it's in a balance, no, what we find in science and uh, again the 
progress that uh, the country wants to have. <laughs> I agree with what uh, Dr. Vallejo said. No, kailangan may balance. But uh, if you ask me as a scientist, no, I need to have a good decision based on extensive studies. No, I cannot, from my position, say anything final just based on the little that I know and I've read as a scientist. So you're asking me for, as a scientist, no? so I answer you as a scientist. No? But what they are saying, okay yun, no? And going back to the talk in planning kanina, just to, just to ano, no? elaborate on what I'm saying. In planning, you need to consult experts from different sectors. Agriculture, forestry, mining, uh, coastal, environment, biodiversity, etc. We, we have not even, <laughs> from, my, from my position, uh, we, we have not even discussed with all of them. And in that absence, no, mahirap as a scientist magsalita. Kung yun lang ginagawa ko, okay lang. Siguro makakakonsult ko lahat. No? Spend all of the time. But hindi lang ang ginagawa ko. No? As a scientist. And that's the answer. So I, I hold it first. No? Until all of the data come in. All of the discussions are finished. Consulting everybody. Not just one group. But all sectors. And then and only then. Can I be able to answer this very tricky question. Thank you. But uh, you know, how are we treating uh, land reclamation in Manila Bay and master planning? Um, there has been already two uh, important uh, recommendations made by the study team uh, concerning uh, land reclamation. And that is one, uh, to postpone uh, further processing of uh, land reclamation proposals. Uh, and then second, um, second is that to require all proponents to submit uh, full uh, proposals, both uh, land development as well as vertical development, so that we can properly assess what will be the total impacts of uh, you know, land reclamation projects. Because uh, in the past, most of the proposals are just land development, I mean horizontal developments. No? Nagtatambak lang and yet uh, we don't know what's going to happen to that island you know, once it's uh, completed. So, uh, kapag ka in ka inassess mo yung impacts nun, eh, baka konti lang makikita mo. No? Whereas, if you have the complete proposal that includes yung ano bang lalagay dyan, commercial, industrial, you know, etc., then uh, you will be able to gauge, you know, uh, much better what will be the impacts on the environment. So that's uh, that second. And then the third thing that we're doing in Manila Bay is that uh, we're, uh, we have, um, we were asked actually by, uh, by NEDA to, uh, to develop a zoning framework. A zoning framework from Manila Bay to, un to identify yung sinasabi kanina ni uh, Prof. Rene. No? Asan ba yung mga non-negotiables natin? Where are the non-negotiables? And uh, yun ang hindi ko na ipakita kanina doon sa presentation ko. But based on sa aming draft as it stands right now, the non-negotiables are mostly in the Northern Bay. No? Sa Northern part talaga yun. Kasi that is where we identified most of the remaining natural habitats. No? And uh, um, uh, we also identified yung mga special uses, you know, like navigation lanes, you know, and uh, port areas, you know, mooring areas. So, Ito yung mga special zones, but uh, we also try to identify as any mga multiple use zones. You know, where we can have uh, fisheries, uh, fish corals, you know, um, other, others, uh, other uses, production uses, you know. That may include, that may include land reclamation, okay. But uh, this is, you know, after, you know, after identifying all those that are non-negotiables. 
and I think that is the first uh, most uh, first and most important thing you know to uh, to ensure that in the zoning framework that is there okay but uh, I do agree with uh, with uh, Mahar you know and with Ben you know that uh, we can you know we can if you look at the the zoning uh, if you look at the principles that we have laid down in the zoning framework one of the things that we have identified there are yung mga areas that are developmental no that includes land reclamation and we um, merong ano yan, very specific doon yung guidelines because of the potential na no, because of the potential uh, negative impacts of uh, you know, of uh, uh, development projects in Manila Bay, it has to be subject for in-depth, uh, comprehensive uh, study. So, yun yung nakalagay doon sa zoning uh, framework. Meron tayong yun as it stands. So, uh, yun. No? I think uh, those are the things that uh, we're doing right now, you know. It's a uh, master plan for Manila Bay. Tapos na. <laughs> Ako ang position ko, hindi rin absolute no, pero ay, nasa position ako na dapat moratorium. Um, matagal na akong nag-review, uh, 20 years na, and actually kung ang ating asahan ay ang EIS system, it doesn't. Um, well, it works, <laughs> pero kung uh, system perspective, hindi siya, hindi siya nag-work. Um, and and I ikutan ito like like uh, kung ang Mandawe yung Kansaga Bay kung ang applyan mo ay 200 hectares mas mahirap dito sa central office process eh hindi e tingi tingi nila kasi regional lang and then you get the 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 ECC in in, in 3 months so so ay, siguro ano hin siya uh, tingnan siya um, dapat dapat for example Ang Magellan Bay, kung nasaan namatay si Magellan, ay actually mayroon yang ECC. That's 500 hectares of coastal reclamation sa North Mactan. May ECC na yan. Hindi lang ginalaw. Salamat na hindi ginalaw, pero may ECC na yan. Ang Cordoba of Mactan Bay is also 4,000 hectares of coastal area. Seagrass, mangroves, corals. Uh, hindi pa lahat. Pero up for grabs kung si mayor ang kausap mo. Pero I think ang 1.5 for SM ay meron na rin. 1,500 hectares. So, so siguro nga kailangan may, may, may pulsiya. Sa akin hindi absolute no, but let's let's have a look and, 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 and see things and identify the non-negotiables. Tapos yun, hindi, hindi dapat yan galawin. We, we still have the EIS later system pero dapat yung non-negotiables ay yun na yun siya. Hindi lang, hindi lang din yung protected area system. Mangroves are actually automatically protected areas. Hindi mo kailangang i-declare yun actually. Pero still, uh, hindi siya, hindi siya nag-work that way. Kahit may isa, dalawa, tatlo, apat na nilad dyan, it's not about the tree, it's about the system. Bakit may isang puno dyan, isang puno lang yan eh. I mean, okay, biodiversity, pero we need numbers. Isang hektarya na, na, na tinaniman mo, isang hektarya lang yan. We need 9,000. So, if you have to target for 10% 10, 10 of that area. So, ang, ang laki nun. So, dapat planuhin yon kung saan nilalagay. Alin dito ang 9,000, alin dito ang medyo pag-uusapan natin. But maybe the 9,000, if we say 10%, hanapin na natin yon. And that's, let's say, non-negotiable. Yung iba, negotiables. No? So, Sa ako lang, it's, it's, it's not absolute no, but I, I still go for the matagal ng call. Now, let's have a, a moratorium and talk about this more, more deeply and more scientifically. Dapat mas maraming, mas maraming datos mo nang tingnan. Di ba? Thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, ano lang, one, one, one small addition. Ano, uh, isa na sa mga uh, napag-usapan po ng, ng uh, study team together with PRA is to, uh, to push through with their proposed yung programmatic EIA. In other words, you know, uh, take all those potential uh, project proposals you know, all together as one and then assess what will be the total impacts. 
you know, of all those proposed land reclamation. Hindi yung by project, eh, no? Hindi yung by project ang, ano, ang, ang uh, assessment ng environmental impacts, but, you know, take them all together as one, yeah, as one, you know, as one source of uh, impacts you know, on Manila Bay, so. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give a round of applause for all our speakers. We will now give due recognition to the contribution of our experts and speakers and those who responded in this forum. May we request Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena E. Pernia, UP Padayan Public Service Office, and UP Padayan Public Service Office Director, Dr. Jeanette Elia Sol Naval, in front to give the certificates of recognition and appreciation. This certificate of recognition is awarded to the following persons for sharing their research and expertise in Hashtag That's My Bay, a forum on UP initiatives in keeping Manila Bay alive, held on September 23, 2019 at the Institute of Environmental Science and Meteorology, Auditorium University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City. Given this 23rd day of September 2019, signed by Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena E. Pernia, and UP Padayan Public Service Office Director, Dr. Jeanette Elia Solnaval. Uh, recognition to Professor uh, Rex Victor O. Cruz. Uh, Professor Laura David, is she here? Professor Benjamin M. Vallejo, Jr. <laughs> Professor Rene N. Rollion. Professor Melody Ann B. Ocampo. <laughs> Professor Alfredo Mahar Francisco Lagmay. and Professor Giovanni Tapang. Uh, the Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to the following persons for sharing their valuable insights on behalf of their government agencies in Hashtag That's My Bay, a forum on UP initiatives in keeping Manila Bay alive, held on September 23, 2019 at IESM Auditorium. Uh, the representative, uh, Jacob F. Maimban, Jr. from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Their representatives. and Mr. Christian Vincent Satuna from the Coastal and Marine Division of DENR. Thank you very much. Today is another learning experience for all of us because we were able to learn from university experts enlisted to collaborate with government units for the rehabilitation of Manila Bay. This forum will be formally ended with the closing remarks to be delivered by UP Padayan Public Service Office Director Dr. Jeanette Elia Solnaval. We are also inviting everyone to stay for the photo op after the singing of the UP Naming Mahal. Uh, magandang tanghali na po mula nagsimula tayo sa umaga. Uh, tunay na buhay na buhay pa ang uh, Manila Bay at lalong buhay na buhay ang ating diskusyon at diskurso kaugnay ng pagpapanatiling buhay ng Lok ng Maynila. Uh, hayaan niyo po, please, please allow me to give you a very, very short um, 
uh, history of, uh, of this forum. So early this year, the UP Padayan Public Service Office of the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs was given a directive by the Board of Regents to uh, identify possible engagements of UP on the, Mani on the ongoing Manila Bay Rehabilitation Project. So from then on, uh, UP Padayon started its research and the series of uh, interview and um, a little conference you know, that we had with people, and sometimes even groups, who were identified to have studies and research on the Manila Bay. Uh, also with uh, groups that are currently engaging already, engaging themselves in the Manila Bay rehabilitation effort. And um, uh, in the end, um, the UP Padayan Public Service Office, uh, this actually led to us forging a network of experts that we were able to bring together for today's uh, forum. And so uh, with that, we would like to thank our uh, speakers for, uh, who, who actually shared their expertise and research to us this morning. So starting with uh, Dr. Uh, Victor Rex Cruz, and uh, Dr. Uh, Mahar Lagmay, Dr. Rolion, and Dr. Ay, nawala na po sila. <laughs> ben Valiero, and of course, uh, there's uh, Professor Valiero and also uh, Professor Ocampo. Uh, we, are, we are hoping that uh, with the forum today, we were able to fulfill the task of uh, uh, fulfill, I mean, we were able to, to, to fulfill our task of creating this collaboration uh, and, and engagements no, between uh, the university and the general public, of course, uh, our uh, uh, government agencies, our, our LGUs. I think we also have representative here from uh, the city of uh, Las Piñas. Uh, that we were not able to acknowledge uh, this morning, but I think um, a representative was with us with us here this morning. So um, uh, thank you very much for gracing our our forum today. But also let me take this opportunity to uh, thank um, the UP Padayon team, of course, our Vice President uh, Manny Pernia for for being with us this whole, the whole time, and. Our, our, well, of course, our speakers, our guests from DNR, our guests from the Metropolitan, uh, from the Manila Bay uh, Rehabilitation uh, Master Plan uh, Group, also our um, faculty, our MSTP students, and uh, of course the Institute of Environmental Science and Meteorology for uh, the space that they've provided. Uh, us this morning, and um, of course the ITDC for covering um, our forum live. So we have live stream of this. Actually, there's another room full of people outside. Um, nasa live stream ng halang sila because we could not accommodate them here anymore. So we would like to thank ITDC, and of course uh, I think ABS-CBN also covered our event for for today. So hanggang sa muli po. Uh, I, um, yes, and uh, of course our our sister our sister office uh, in the office of the vice president for public affairs, the media public relations uh, office. So, hindi pa po dito nagtatapos to po ng binanggit kanina. Uh, we still need to uh, present the the research and uh, the research coming from the social science uh, discipline the other disciplines no uh, we're sure they they have uh, also a lot to offer uh, on the discussion about the manila bay so thank you very much and uh, we hope to see you again in in the future uh, forum thank you thank you very much director Sol Navar. for more information about the collaborative efforts of the university for the rehabilitation of manila bay, manila bay and other public service projects you may visit up public service in facebook and our website at publicservice.up.edu.ph everyone we are enjoining you to stay with us for the photo opportunity and for the singing of the up naming mahal please rise